and um, tutorial is on a GitHub repository. You can see here the, the IO out, um, layout of, of this. So you can just go through this little um, link here to just learn about CSM on your laptop without necessarily having like 10 different presentations. So it's really cool. And one of them in the, exerci in the exercises is a CISM exercise that Kelly and I uh, wrote. Um, it's a simple TCOM set model. And here I want to say that you, the community, if you have a cool experiment that you're working on that you run and you think that it would be very good for, to, for people to learn about and to, or to learn how to set up and to run, please let us know and we could add it or you could add it yourself here. So this is it. Thank you very much. Um, I think I broke my own rule like by going for 19 minutes. <laughs> But again, so if you have any questions, as usual, contact us, uh, whether the coaches, me and Viscano here, or myself, or the liaison, well, myself, and, and Kate, who is right here. And I'll take any questions if you have any. Thank you very much. And while we transition, maybe we can get rid of this bar. Maybe if we close this real quick. I would say if there are any questions in the chat, maybe if you wrote it, you can unmute yourself and ask it live. All right, then. Um, then our next speaker is um, Kate Calder. It's going, she's going to talk us talk about improving seasonality of glacial runoff in CSM. This is down here. Can everybody hear me? I feel bad that we didn't get to see the chat. I don't see it here at all. So, <laughs> um, Hi, everybody. My name is Kate. Um, I think I know most of you in the room, but if there's anybody who uh, wants to ask questions about CESM. I'm the CESM liaison for the Land Ice Group. So um, feel free to come up and talk to me whenever or send me an email. Um, you saw Gunter's stuff on the previous uh, talk. So I called this talk Improving Seasonality of Glacier Runoff in CESM because it sounds um, very professional and cool, but really the talk should be called How to Stop Glaciers from Sucking Water Out of the Ocean because that's what they're doing right now. Um, this is very much a work in progress, um, and it's kind of a sort of an edge case in CESM3 um, that has been causing a little consternation, so we're trying to get uh, some work done. But it's my first um, CLM coding project ever, so uh, it's been a learning experience for me. 
So this is a, a quick talk about this work in progress. Um, I'm going to talk about, you know, why does the Greenland ice sheet suck water out of the ocean in CESM2? And what our plan is to stop this, because it's kind of an interesting um, algorithm, I think, uh, to deal with the situation. And then uh, give a quick overview of where we are currently in the implementation of this plan. So just to go back and give you some context for what is happening here. Um, in CESM2 currently, the default mode for SISM is a no evolve mode. So it's considered one-way coupling. SISM is not dynamically active. And uh, you can see from this figure uh, from Laura's paper, I'm not going to try to pronounce her last name again, sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry, Laura, um, that when SISM is fully coupled, we have interactions between SISM back to CLM. We have interactions with the um, ice sheet topography in the atmosphere, and we have a direct freshwater flush flux from the glacier to the ocean. But when SISM is inactive, the ice sheet has to maintain its size and mass balance. Um, so we actually don't have any of these um, fluxes anymore. It's all just directly from CLM, the land model, to SISM or CLM to the ocean via snow capping and runoff. So none of the stuff is coming from SISM anymore. It's all CLM now. Oh, and yeah, this actually applies to uh, a stub glacier model or a, if we had a data glacier model, which is what the no evolved mode is like. Um, SISM handles all of these fluxes in those cases. So um, even though the ice sheet is not evolving or not growing, CLM still calculates a surface mass balance that gets downscaled to the glacier grid um, so that you could record this later and use it as a forcing for a Greenland ice sheet if you wanted to. Um, so it is still calculating uh, ice um, increases and decreases due to melting. And it's handling that in the snow fern layer above the glacier. Um, so we have, um, or CLM has a feature called snow capping. <laughs> so once the amount of snow above the glacier gets above 10 meters of liquid water equivalent, um, it has to do something with that. CLM can no longer handle that amount of snow. So if SISM is evolving, it takes that excess snow and it hands it off to SISM and says, hey, you've got new ice and the ice sheet will grow. But when SISM is not evolving or you don't have an active ice sheet below CLM, and it takes that snow capping flux and it just sends it to the ocean as runoff directly. So that means that when there is high precipitation and cold periods on Greenland ice sheet, so like during the winter, the ocean is actually seeing quite a bit of fresh water runoff from the ice sheet at that point, which is not physical. So this is also an issue with melt, actually, but kind of in the reverse direction. If SISM is evolving, then once CLM melts all the snow, it can go tell SISM, hey, melt some of your ice. And SISM, the ice sheet will decrease over time in those ablation areas. But if SISM is not evolving, then when CLM melts through all of the snow, it has no more ice to melt. It needs to maintain its size and mass. So it just sort of pulls some water out of the ocean to maintain the ice sheet mass. <laughs> um, this is an issue. And you can see this is a figure that I made from just a basic um, eye case actually running with the stub glacier model of the, the ice runoff to the coupler in September. Um, so there's quite a lot of snow capping flux coming from the center of Greenland um, and then this negative ice flux coming um, from around the edges or the ablation area. So that's going to go to the coupler and the coupler is going to tell the ocean, hey, you need to provide some fresh water so that the ice sheet can stay its right size. So you know, this is an issue. Um, it's not physical. Ice sheets, I mean, they do grow, but they don't typically grow by pulling water out of the ocean. Um, when you pull fresh water from the ocean, it increases the salinity and fresh, the salinity around Greenland. I'm not an oceanographer, so I don't entirely understand all of this, but there's a very important salinity current in the ocean, and it gets messed up. <laughs> so we, uh, we want to fix this problem so that our uncoupled simulations can provide appropriate ocean forcing from Greenland at the correct seasonality. So what is the plan to stop this? Well, in real life, excess snow on top of the Greenland glacier does not run off directly to the ocean. It does build up a bit of ice on top, and then the ice sheet slowly moves towards the ocean. You guys all know this, you're ice sheet scientists. Um, once it gets to the ablation area, there's always sort of an 
new ice available to melt at that point. So you don't have this problem of melting running out of ice in the real world because the ice is available on top of the glacier. So basically we need to stop treating the ocean like a giant freshwater reservoir for the glacier and start saving fresh water from snow capping for the glacier to be available for the melting later in the summer. Um, so the idea is that we're going to need to implement a storage reservoir for that excess snow capping snow in the glacier um, so that there's mass available for the cells as they melt in the uh, fall and summer each year. Um, since snow capping is actually spread out somewhat evenly during the year, but the melt is concentrated during the summer months, that means we sort of need to build up a big enough reservoir to balance a large amount of melt in the fall. Um, so there's going to be a bit of a, a storage period and then we'll have the um, snow available to counteract the melt. So this is the, uh, the idea for the algorithm. Um, I think I have some time so I can sort of describe this in some detail. But basically for every time step until say one year or two year and we can determine some testing how long we need to accumulate. We're going to accumulate all of the melt on all of the grid cells and all of the snow capping fluxes on all the grid cells and then we'll add the snow capping to the reservoir. And then every coupling time step we'll have to do a global sum of the total melt on the ice sheet and then also a global sum of all of the total snow capping available at that point. So that's what you're seeing here and here. Global sums over the ice sheet. And then we'll calculate what's called a fractional melt. So that would be the percent of the total reservoir that we have available required to cover the total melt that happened on the ice sheet during that coupling time step. And that will give us a local replenishing amount, which would be the fraction of the local reservoir required to belt balance the fractional total melt required. And I know it's kind of confusing, but I've got some numbers to explain in the next slide more directly and it makes more sense. But then we'll also calculate sort of a replenishing time scale. So how long you want to keep the ice um, in the reservoir versus how long you want to send it to the ocean because it doesn't eventually need to get back to the ocean. You can't just store it forever. Um, so, oh yeah, sorry, that bottom part. Um, so then we'll have a certain fraction of that reservoir go to the ocean as runoff um, as well. So basically with actual numbers, so this makes a little bit more sense. Um, if you say the total melt at your coupling time step is five gigatons and the reservoir that you have at that point for snow capped um, availability is 500 gigatons, then your fractional melt at that point will be five divided by 500 or about 1%. And we're going to apply that 1% to every single local reservoir as a melt tax. So some reservoirs that may have more ice will provide more balancing and some reservoirs that have less ice will provide less balancing but we won't ever ask for more ice than is in the reservoir at that point. So it provides a nice um, uh, flat tax is kind of what you would think about it, a melt tax. Everybody, all of the glaciers will give according to what they have available in their reservoir. And then we'll add that amount of water back to the ocean so that would give us a 0 0.013 gigaton ocean runoff um, from our reservoir. And over time, that will increase if the reservoir increases as well or decrease if the reservoir decreases as well. So it should help maintain a balance in the reservoir over the ice sheet and it will provide ice to counteract the, uh, the, the melting at each point. The ice sheet should not grow or lose mass uh, beyond what's added to the reservoir. And we shouldn't have any negative ice fluxes. Um, in most cases, however, there's a possibility that if there is a massive melt year that goes beyond what's available in the total reservoir that we could actually still see a negative ice flux in that case. So where are we at in the implementation? Uh, like I said earlier, this is my first CTSM project, so Bill Sachs is helping me. Um, well, he's not in here, so oh well. Um, but I have the data structures implemented and I've added the snow capping reservoir and I've diverted the snow capping into that reservoir at all of the local columns. Um, so that's, that's what I've got so far. Um, and I, I know that that's working because it took about two time steps for CLM balance checker to be like, whoa, where's all your water going to? <laughs> um, it, it stopped the run immediately. So now I'm implementing adding in this reservoir to the balance checker, which was something that I had not uh, initially envisioned. Um, the CLM balance checker, I'm very impressed with how carefully they account for all of the water in CLM. Uh, and we need to make sure that we're accounting for it appropriately. 
Um, I'm learning about how they do the column to grid average in CLM right now, because uh, that's giving me a little bit of trouble, and I'll be checking in with Bill about that after this present, well, after this conference. Um, if I turn off the balance checker, I can't actually get it to run for about five months, and uh, it's diverting ice, but I can, yeah, get a plot that I wanted to show you for that. <laughs> um, so there are possible future issues. Um, like I said, there's questions about including this water in the conservations of CLM, because I feel like the CLM um, conservation is more of a each time step conservation check, and this reservoir is going to be building over time. So we need to find a way to let CLM know that it's okay for this water to go into that spot, um, and it'll come back. Uh, implementing this time delay is going to be a little bit of an issue. There's going to be some um, custom time functionality that we have to add into CLM to check for if we've made it to the point that we want it to be, um, that we're ready to start doling the water back out. Um, and currently CLM actually doesn't have any global sums or um, a lot of inter-process communication. It's all done on a column level. So if we want to do those global sums to maintain our fractional um, ice to get the flat tax number, um, we're going to need to add some of that into CLM. So that could be an issue in the, in the future for sure, the near future. So after all this work, um, as I mentioned previously, there's possibility that there could still be negative ice fluxes under some extreme circumstances, which could be an issue as well. So that's all I have for today. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts or comments or issues from people. Uh, would you consider from this? I don't, I think I did on time. Okay, good. All right, thank you guys all very much. <laughs>
I don't see any questions on online. So thank you, Kate. Bye. Um, yeah, my screen. <laughs> At least I think so. All right. We are going to move to our next speaker. Um, Senling He, who's, uh, who's actually online. So Senling, can you, do you hear us? Can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Ah. Um, do you want me to share my screen or you want to do that on your side? Do you need to end this? Can you share your screen with us, please? Um, it says I cannot share screen while the other participant okay. is shared. Just one second. Simon, can you share your screen, please? Uh, okay, yeah. So can you see my screen now? Um, how about now? Pursuing. This one. I think I just switched that one. Oh, good. Okay. So this is the his presentation. So everything's good. All right, I think we're good to to hand it out to you, uh, Senlin. Can can you okay. hear us? Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? And can, could you talk a little bit louder? Oh, can you hear me? Um, is is this good? Is it on our end or can can you can you say blah blah blah? Blah 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> is, is this louder? Uh, better. No? Oh, okay. That's better. All right. Um, the floor is yours. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Sunny uh, from Menka. So, um, uh, myself has never used the uh, CISM model be before. Uh, I'm mainly working with the CRM, but uh, I think uh, Kate, uh, Kate has given a very good uh, background uh, introduction for me. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, how the CRM and the CISM uh, like interact with each other uh, or 
well, what if uh, um, the CISM is not activated? Then what's what's going on inside the CRM in terms of the ice sheet uh, simulations? So my talk today is about the new features and enhancements in CSM CRM Snow Albedo scheme. Uh, based on my understanding, um, if um, in a couple of rounds, probably like uh, the CRM will handle the basic land service energy balance uh, over the ice sheet and then pass the basic flux uh, to the CISM model. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I think this is where this snow air beetle even over the ice sheet uh, could play a critical role um, in determining the uh, energy balance uh, over the ice sheet. So uh, um, uh, I don't need to point out the importance of this you know, albedo because it, it, is, um, it can trigger a very strong positive feedback uh, uh, over the land ice and the snow um, snowpack. Um, so this presentation is mainly about the enhancement in the snow albedo scheme towards a more physical and a realistic representation of the snow radiation and aerosol interactions. And this is also very important because uh, as we know, the dust has a very strong impact over the Greenland ice sheet to drive the, or uh, to accelerate the um, glacier ice melting. So, okay, so just a very brief uh, background to uh, introduce how these uh, different uh, um, snow properties and radiation interact with each other in the physics uh, perspective. So first uh, we have the snow physical, physical properties and then it interact with the radiation uh, to have the snow radiative properties and then go through this radiation transfer to get the snowpack air beetle. Uh, this is true over both the uh, land ice service and also the uh, land soil service if you have the snow cover on top of it. Uh, and in terms of the physical properties for snow green, uh, we, typically we have this uh, green size, shape, and the refractive index to decide the, the uh, snow radiative properties. Uh, the key properties are extinction, uh, single scattering albedo, and asymmetry factor. And then using these uh, radiative properties of snow, plus the snowpack properties like density, thickness, layer structures, and then we use the snow radio transfer calculations to get the air beetle. Now, what if we have the light absorbing aerosols such as dust or soot particles? Um, then these aerosols, uh, uh, after depth eating onto the snowpack surface, then it will mixed, uh, it will be mixed with the snow grains, uh, which will also affect the snow radiative properties and then further affect the snow green, uh, snowpack air beetle. Um, and this is actually a, a full feedback loop in the coupled model simulations. Uh, the snowpack air beetle will further uh, affect the, uh, will further affect the environment, such as surface temperature, snowfall, wind, relative humidity, and all these uh, changes uh, in the environment will feedback to the fresh snowfall and snow aging to affect the snow physical properties here. And also it will affect the snowpack properties through the aging and melting. And lastly, it will also affect the aerosol transport deposition and the removal in snowpack. So this is the full uh, feedback loop uh, in terms of how the snow radiation and aerosols interact with each other inside a coupled model system. Okay, now let's look at how the general workflow for the CTSM CRM um, snow air beetle schemes. So the snow air beetle already transfer schemes inside the CTSM CRM is called SNICA, the snow ice uh, um, ready trans uh, aerosol ready transfer scheme. So this workflow with the blue boxes uh, showing the default or existing capabilities and the orange boxes are the new capabilities added in this study. So first uh, we have the snow aging and then which affects the snow green size. Uh, we have the aerosol type from the atmospheric model. And then we go to this uh, mean calculation for the radiative property uh, lookup table. Uh, the first uh, updates we do is that we updated the ice and aerosol optical database uh, as an input data into the CRM model. And then using this lookup table, the model will uh, read in the snow optical properties based on uh, snow grain size and aerosol types. And, uh, and then we have these uh, snow optical properties and aerosol properties go to the snow aerosol mixing. 
Um, so the second uh, enhancement we did is that we add a non-spherical snow green treatment uh, into the model to affect the snow optical properties. Originally, all the snow greens are assumed to be spherical inside the CRM, uh, which which we know is not true uh, in most of the time in reality. Um, and then once we have the snow aerosol mixing, then um, uh, based on the snow mass and also aerosol content inside the snow, the model assumes the, the so-called uh, snow aerosol external mixing, which means that the aerosols mixed outside the snow greens. This allows a linear combination of the optical properties from snow and aerosols. Uh, however, in reality, we have a lot of aerosols mixed inside the snow greens by uh, acting as uh, ice nuclei in the atmosphere and after deposition, it, they, they were just mixed inside the snow greens. So the third enhancement we did is that we add this uh, uh, snow aerosol internal mixing treatment into the model, which actually will uh, substantially enhance the aerosol induced snow albedo reduction in the model. Okay, after the, this uh, snow aerosol mixing treatment, then we will have uh, effective optical properties from the aerosol snow mixtures. And this will be passed to the ready transfer solver to calculate the narrow band or spectral snow albedo and then further the broad band albedo. So about these solvers, originally uh, we use this uh, 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 traditional two stream solver. However, there are several um, disadvantages in terms of its accuracy, its uh, computational efficiencies. Uh, so our fourth um, enhancement is to add a more accurate and a more computationally efficient adding doubling to stream. This actually is following the uh, CI's uh, ready to transfer solver in the CESM. Um, so, so we Actually, now this uh, ready transfer solver is able to treat the snow and ice uh, together uh, in a coherent way. Um, and then we also add a hyperspectral cap capabilities. So uh, for those who are familiar with CRM, uh, currently the, uh, the snow air below calculations are for five bands, uh, one visible band and four near infrared bands. However, this would cause some of the uh, inaccuracies in the results because of the nonlinearity in the radio transfer. Um, so we add a very high, uh, high resolution, high spectral resolution uh, capabilities with a 10 nanometer uh, spectral resolution into the model. Um, and lastly, our enhancement includes the updated downward solar spectral, which is used to uh, integrate the narrow band or spectral snow albedo into the broadband, one visible and one near infrared snow albedo, which is used by other energy uh, processes in CRM. Okay, so here is a table listing all the enhancements I just mentioned in the last slide. So um, if you look at these red uh, words or red, red parts, um, these are the new enhancements uh, we added to the uh, CRM snow albedo scheme including updated uh, ice and aerosol optical properties, updated downward solar spectra, more accurate radiation transfer solver, non-spherical snow grains, um, suit or black carbon dust snow internal mixing where the aerosols mixed inside the snow grains and also the hyperspectral calculations, which allows uh, a very accurate uh, calculations for the snow air below. And on the second uh, column uh, here, I'm showing the name list control for the new default CRM. So actually when we implement all these enhancements, we implemented those as additional uh, physics options instead of directly remove the original sneaker uh, uh, or uh, original snow air below uh, um, parameterizations. Uh, so here you could have uh, different choices for this uh, multiple of physics options for each of the key uh, physical uh, processes or physical elements in snow albedo calculation. This is also an advantage for the multi uh, physics uh, uh, ensemble simulations in the future if people are uh, interested in the snow albedo processes and uh, associated uncertainties. So the uh, bold words here are showing the default, new default uh, name list uh, uh, options uh, for the snow air beetle ca uh, calculations. One, uh, two things I want to point out here. One is we use the most, uh, uh, use the ac more accurate uh, um, 
ready transfer servers in the new default. And also we assume a, a hexagonal a snow green shape, which is non-sphere uh, in the um, in the new default. This is because based on observations and uh, uh, model previous modeling studies, most of the ice crystals are tend to be uh, uh, hexagonal shapes. Uh, so that's why we use this as a new default. So to set up the global simulations to understand uh, the impact and uh, to do a preliminary evaluation of this, uh, we, we actually use the data-driven uh, offline simulations for the global CRM simulation at one degree resolution. We use the GSWA version three atmospheric forcing. Uh, we run the model from 2000 to 2010 with the first six year as spin up and the last five year for analysis. Uh, so in the next few slides, I'm going to show you some of the evaluation um, results for the key uh, snow service quantities. Uh, so first one is the snow albedo evaluation. Um, so in general, uh, oh, the observations we use is the MODIS global air service albedo uh, data product. And when we do this evaluation, we only do the evaluation over 100% snow covered pixels to remove the uh, um, the impact from the um, uncertainties in the vegetation simulations. Um, so here, um, uh, as you can see here on the left column is the MODIS uh, five, year, uh, five year mean annual uh, service air beetle for the diffuse uh, visible uh, air beetle on the uh, uh, on the first row, and then uh, the diffuse the NIR, the near infrared band air beetle on, uh, on the bottom row. And on the second column, I'm showing the default CRM air beetle bias. Uh, and then the last column is the difference between the new uh, and the old um, CRM snow air beetle scheme simulations. So as you can see here. Um, the default CRM shows a very substantial uh, air beetle uh, underestimates over the middle latitude uh, mountain regions uh, um, in both the visible and the near infrared band. And then uh, using the new um, snow air beetle schemes, so we actually improved the uh, air beetle over the middle latitude mountain region snowpack and ours. Uh, uh, in both the visible and the near infrared. These these improvements are mainly. Uh, coming from the accurate uh, um, relative uh, relative transfer solver and also the uh, the assumption of the non spherical snow grains, but uh, as you can see here, we actually uh, degrade the model performance a little bit over the uh, Greenland and also the Antarctic uh, regions, uh, uh, where people uh, in this group are mostly interested. Uh, but however, um, this actually improves uh, a little bit about the other snow quantities, snowpack quantities, as I will show you in the next few slides. So here I'm showing the snow cover evaluation uh, by comparing with the MODIS uh, snow cover. Um, so the first row shows the winter, uh, December, January, February uh, seasonal mean, and the bottom column is showing the spring, uh, um, March, April, May uh, seasonal mean. I'm showing these two seasons, is because these two seasons are showing the most uh, uh, significant impacts from the uh, uh, new schemes. So here, as you can see on the uh, second column, it's the default uh, uh, CRM snow cover bias. Um, as we can see here, it shows some of the uh, significant uh, uh, underestimates of the snow cover over the mid to the uh, um, seasonal snowpack and also mountain glaciers over Tibetan plateau, for example, here. And here, and then uh, over those underestimated regions, our new schemes are actually uh, improving the uh, snow cover fraction uh, simulations are showing here. So this is because originally in the CRM, the snow air beetle is underestimated. So that's why the snow cover is underestimated because of the snow air beetle feedback. Uh, where you have low snow air beetle, then you have a uh, stronger snow melting. Uh, which induces a uh, low bias of the or underestimates in the snow cover. But uh, our uh, our new schemes actually uh, improve this. Uh, 
Then the next one is the SWE, snow water equivalent evaluations. So uh, we are comparing this with the ERA5 SWE for uh, the same as for the uh, winter uh, on the top row and the spring on the bottom row. So here, um, when we do these comparisons, we actually remove all the pixels with the snow capping um, because as Kate mentioned, um, it, it is not reasonable to compare with the uh, real analysis or observation data for those pixels with snow capping because uh, the snow will never goes up uh, when, once it reaches the 10 meter uh, snow water equivalent. So we remove those uh, over most of the Greenland pixels and also the uh, Antarctic ice sheet pixels. But uh, you can still see that over the coastal areas, originally the CRM has a very strong um, underestimates in the SWE, snow water equivalent uh, over the coast of the um, Greenland. However, after we use the uh, new scheme, uh, snow albedo scheme, because of a higher snow albedo in our new simulations, then we actually gain uh, a lot of uh, SWE uh, in the coast coasts of the uh, of the Greenland, which actually improves the model's performance to reduce the original low bias of these uh, over these regions. And similarly for the spring, we also see an improvement uh, over the uh, mountain uh, glaciers uh, over the Tibetan plateau and also some of the uh, North American uh, uh, Rocky Mountain regions. And uh, similarly, uh, if we look at the snow depth evaluations, uh, uh, actually we we also see that uh, over the coasts of the Greenland or even the Antarctic ice sheets, we see a lot of uh, underestimates in the original CRM simulations. Uh, but uh, with our new schemes, uh, actually the, we reduce these uh, um, uh, underestimates in snow depths uh, over these regions. And all the other empty or white pixels are actually the pixels where, where with the snow capping, which we removed from this evaluation. Um, okay, so I think uh, I think I probably uh, don't have enough time to go through all, all of the following ones, but uh, I will just use this two meter temperature evaluation as the ending point uh, and allow a more, a more time for discussions. Um, so here, uh, our last evaluation is for the two meter temperature. Um, uh, still comparing with the ERA5 uh, reanalysis data. Um, as you can see here, um, for the default CRM simulations, we have a very strong uh, positive uh, T2 bias uh, over the North American mountain regions and also the Tibetan Plateau glacier regions, as well as the Antarctic and also the Greenland regions. Uh, and using our new schemes, uh, we see uh, um, a medium uh, improvement of uh, over the Northern middle latitude, the mountain snowpack and glacier regions, uh, but a strong uh, improvements over the ice sheet, uh, Antarctic ice sheet for the T2 temperature. This is because of, um, again, the uh, positive snow albedo feedback, uh, where we have higher snow albedo in the new scheme uh, simulations, then we have the more snow cover and we have more sweet, more snow depths, and then we have a, a colder temperature, which reduces the original positive T2 temperature over the Antarctic regions and also the mid northern mid latitude uh, um, mountain regions. Uh, and with that, I will just uh, stop here. Uh, I, uh, if you are interested in the, all those uh, uh, sensitivities of each of the key uh, enhancements we added to the model, uh, I have a few slides here to show the impact of the non-spherical snow grains, uh, which is actually increased the snow albedo a lot, particularly over the uh, polar regions. And also the aerosol mixing, uh, internal mixing, uh, where we have the aerosol mixed inside of the snow grains. So if you are interested in all these details, you can take a look at my uh, slides later after the workshop. I think uh, uh, um, uh, they, will, they will share these slides uh, um, uh, to the public uh, online. So with that, I would like to stop here and take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Zenlin. Um, any questions for Zenlin? Yes, Tree. Okay. So uh, great talk. Um, I wanted to ask about the snow grain. So one thing um, I was wondering if, if this was being added or this was included, I just missed it, is uh, the effects of blowing snow, uh, snow grain erosion. So if, if uh, the change in 
uh, snow grain shape is making a massive difference, I would expect that that would also be affected by blowing snow. And the other thing was about, um, uh, I saw snowfall, but what about rain? Um, and yeah, so I, I think I think that from what I understand, Snicker's working on, on melt ponds as well, but I just wanted to ask about the precipitation phase, if that changes or if that's kind of incorporated into the temperature. Oh, uh, thank you for the question. Um, no, actually this, uh, Snow green treatment, the new snow green treatment is not coupled with any precipitation processes like the precipitation phases or the um, the microphysics schemes in the atmosphere. So right now, this is just a, a first step to have this representation in the model uh, uh, where people can only prescribe the snow green shape in the name list for the snow albedo scheme um, calculations. Um, and in the future, we would like to couple the different treatment and even for the aerosol deposition treatment uh, with the atmospheric models in, inside the CSM. Okay, great, thanks. All right, one more question. Yeah, that, uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, this is just sort of a, a follow on to Tree's question. Um, so it, just to be clear, is wind-based fragmentation of precipitated snow particles is not included in, in the model, is that right? Right, it's not included. Okay. That, potentially could be quite significant in, in these areas where you're seeing the biggest changes. Uh, so the tundra and ice sheet regions, uh, that's uh, the, sort of the dominant factor that affects the uh, dry snow uh, grain size and shape. Yeah, right. So when we do these uh, um, calculations and simulations, uh, we actually use uh, whatever the default uh, setup uh, um, it is inside uh, CRM. Like um, we, we didn't change anything, uh, any physical processes or parameterizations related to uh, snow aging or metamorphism uh, processes inside the CRM. We just use the default one. And then the snow green size is still simulated outside of the snow air beetle schemes uh, uh, using the dry snow metamorphism and the wet snow metamorphism schemes inside the default. Uh, CRM and uh, what we 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 are showing here for the snow green shape effect is that um, this shape effect is under the uh, assumptions that uh, the equivalent uh, or effective green size is the same for the snow greens and it just uh, under this uh, uh, equivalent effective snow green size we if we assume different shapes for the snow greens uh, then what would be the impact. Awesome. Thank you, Sammy. Um, can you stop sharing your screen? Great. And we're going to move to another online speaker. Constancia, are you here? Yes, you are. Yes, yes. Good morning or good afternoon. <laughs> good morning. Um, can you share your screen? Yes, I'm working on it. Perfect. Does this work? Do you see right, screen? Thank you so much. So if, okay. Um, can you? Can we hear you? Can you talk a little bit? Check, check, check. Um, can we do better than that? Is that better? Oh yes. <laughs> okay. The floor is yours. Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks and hello from uh, Bergen, Norway. Um, I'm going to show a little bit of Norway's M, M simulations done with SISM. Um, this work is done um, on the base of Heiko's work and, uh, and Andreas, Petra and in the Klim project. So just a short overview. Um, Norway's M2 is an Earth system model based on CSM2. There is a different ocean model and some different components, for example, on CAM. Um, but the NORISM SISM um, interactions are the same as CESM SISM. So we have the surface mass balance, which is given via an elevation feedback uh, and downscaling every year. Um, and the atmosphere sees changes from the ice sheet every five years. Um, we don't really have ice ocean interactions. This is done uh, through basically the runoff, what uh, Kate kind of 
said, uh, but also the real runoff via Mozart. And yes. Um, um, so we have three simulations which are based on the CMIP6 um, runs, but extended to 2300. Um, so we use SSP 585 uh, scenario. Um, and then uh, this, uh, after 2100 CO2 emissions uh, get really linearly reduced. Um, this is also following the CMIP 6 um, um, recommendations for extensions and other emissions are held constant. So we have a pure Nuri-ESM simulation from the CMIP. There is not even a SISM no evolve. It's, it's basically off. Um, and then we have Nuri-ESM SISM and a control run. So no forcing, but with the same initialized sheet than Nuri-ESM SISM. The normal SISM land ice resolution of four kilometer and ocean and atmosphere land, land are all on one degree, which is about 111, kilo, 111 kilometers times 13 to 55 over Greenland, just to have an idea of this. Um, and just very short about the initialization, because it's a little bit different than what you maybe know from Minturev and all. Um, for the CESM system. So we um, try to keep the Greenland ice sheet very much close to present day um, geometry. So um, the basal friction coefficients are tuned to match the observed present uh, geometry, all during the system initialization all outside um, ice from the observed area is removed and routed into the ocean. And this is all relaxed to the Nuri's um, um, pre-industrial SMB from the SEMA run. And with this initialization, which is very close to present day, um, we get, um, we put this into Nuri ESM and run 50 years to relax all these um, systems together so that everything gets kind of in a good state. Um, both NOIS M states are not so far off from each other. Um, you'll see later. Um, yes, so let's have a look what happens. Um, so in the above panel, you see the SMB every uh, 100 years. Um, the color bar is the same for all of them. And the lower panel, you see the ice thickness. First, the initial one, and then the thickness changes since the initial start in 1850. Um, but the, the color bars there change because um, otherwise, yeah, you wouldn't see anything anymore. Um, so both show um, basically <clears throat> very much <laughs> increased um, melt already starting in now, maybe starting after uh, 200, 300 years. So first after 2100, um, the melt kicks really in. Um, and then we also see increased thickness changes there. Um, I don't have a comparison to the RACMO or more data here, but just as a reminder for the SMB, um, there is kind of some smoothening in land um, for the, the accumulation, but also for the melt. So we would already expect in 2000, a little bit of melt on, on also Northern Greenland or a little bit. So um, there is some bias in there and that might be also seen in the model, but overall we kind of see some crazy melt going on already in 2200. Um, so here you see just the, the line plots to get an overview above the surf SMB from the control run in blue and the Nuri's and SISM run in orange. And the same on the lower panel, the um, uh, sea level contribution. So basically until 2100, not so much is happening. The SMB starts to become... Um, lower in the middle of or in the end of 2100, but it first becomes negative around 2100 and then um, 
it shoots more and more off. Um, what does this mean to the global climate and NOR ESM? So same colors here, but additional in green, only NOR ESM2. So you see here with the global average air temperatures, the differences are minor, but also due to this really high emission scenario, we are, we are really, we're going from 14 degree um, till 23 degrees Celsius, which is uh, a lot on global mean average. Um, and these same colors, I add three more panels. So on the lower right, you saw global average precipitation, then upper um, and surface salinity, and then also the AMARC. All of them show similar patterns. So coupled and not to SISM coupled runs are um, relatively similar, except uh, surface salinity becomes um, less saline um, with the coupled run at some point. Um, the other difference is, for example, also if you look at the AMOC, um, this already, those decreases in AMOC, the circulation already starts in 2000. And remember the, the line plots before Greenland um, the Greenland ice sheet melt first really starts and like 100 years later. So whatever ha happens here is more within nor ESM than really the Greenland ice sheet um, coupling doing anything to the system. Um, yes, let's look a little bit at some spatial plots as well. Um, you see here the evolution of surface air temperatures at degrees Celsius. Um, from Norius and SISM, so every about 100 years. Um, everything basically becomes positive, except just Greenland um, in the ends of the simulation. So really quite dramatic warming. Um, I add another panel below where you see changes since. Um, yeah, this, uh, ignore the PI, this is wrong. This is since 1850. Um, and you see first in the 100, first 150, 100 years, there's even a little bit of cooling uh, in the Southern Greenland Ocean above this. And then we just uh, get extreme warming over the North Pole. Um, the next panel adds these same things, different since, since initial state, but with only noise M. And here you it basically looks the same. So we I'll also add an additional, um, bear with me, um, double differences. So what you see in the lower panel is changes, like the differences in changes since their initial state between NOR-ESM SISM and NOR-ESM. Um, There are different patterns you see here. Interestingly, um, the Norris system seems to be cooler around Greenland and warmer on the surface, but we're kind of comparing the wrong things here because one surface elevation is changing and the other one, it is not. Um, so uh, in all the evaluation, we started more looking also into air temperatures in higher altitudes. So the next um, will show you same changes and same differences and plots, but now on 525 hectopascal air temperatures, which is around five kilometer above sea level. And maybe focus on the lower panel, where you again see the differences between the coupled and the not coupled one. And there you see even on these heights, you still see slightly more warming and then even two degrees Celsius, three degrees Celsius um, higher temperatures. I'm also looking into, just taking time, um, um, into the surface elevation feedback. So how much does this play into role and how much is it more warmer? Um, I'll keep you updated <laughs> or yeah. Um, and I think I'll, yeah. Um, conclude here um, with some um, summaries. Maybe I'll 
can just mention, we also looked at some salinity and there we see in like 400 meter depth, we see some um, differences in, in ocean circulation around the equator. So there is something happening with the runoff, but I'm really happy that uh, about what Kate showed, because this is something I wanted to ask and mention here, but since you're already on it, um, it is super nice to see because we can't really compare runoff in this run because it's computed so differently. I'm so happy to hear about this ongoing work. But the summary. First, we have this covered long-term areas as in seasonal results, which is pretty nice. Um, this overall warming of uh, 585 dominates the whole global climate and the Greenland melt, which is a lot of 1.5 meters, isn't doing so much to the climate, but overall um, the coupling succeeds. We see realistic results. And um, I can also conclude the initialization is crucial for the comparison. So if the initialization would be done so much more different, maybe more freely, maybe to have a more realistic thing for the whole system, or maybe not so tuned, it would be so much harder to compare both states. And maybe thoughts on the next, if anybody has some more interest in running, maybe also there is maybe more CESM planned. I highly recommend not doing these high uh, emission scenarios, but maybe more lower emission scenarios to see more really effects of um, on, a, on a lower yeah, warming what Greenland would do, or maybe uh, short, um, studying the more coupled short times things. Um, and with this, I finish and thanks you for your attention. Thank you very much. Any questions? So I think I saw Sarah in the chat. And Sarah, if you're here, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Hey, Constantine, um, on one of your graphs, it was near the beginning, you had your like four panels and your AMOC had a little increase at about oh, yeah. 2000. Was that just the way the plot was shown or do you know why that is? I don't actually know why this is. Um, both coupled and not coupled show this increase. It's an interesting question, um, but the coupled one shows a little bit of more increase. I actually don't know why. This is still something to uh, yeah look more into or ask the right people. Um, yeah, but good, well spotted. All right, thanks. Any more questions? Are you asking? Push. Okay, hi, uh, thank you very much for this work. Uh, it is fantastic to see. I have two questions. Um, the first one is, well, it's more of a, su a suggestion. Uh, are you able to use the non-coupled run to force offline CISM and then see how much uh, sea level rise you get? And the second, um, question, yeah. the second question is about the scenario that you have used. Um, I, I didn't get whether it was the standard SSP 58.5 extension or you did something else. And just, just for a sense, how much uh, is the CO2 concentration that you have in the atmosphere after 2100? Thank you. Okay, thanks for the question. Um, we can right now not really force um, the... Um, I think it was with the normal noise M you asked, right? Um, because we don't, we did not even put no evolve on. So in the in the noise M pure run, we don't have the elevation classes and everything, but we might be able to do something with it because Mikhail is working on a little bit of thing of this. But so it's not so easy. No. And for the other question, I think uh, let me. Um, the um, the you ask for the CO two concentration the maximum I think it stays about two thousand one hundred ppmv um, if that answers that question Miran um, yeah 
and it, it follows the CMIP extension from O'Neill at all. And is a, a, yeah. Sounds good, thanks. Any more questions for Constanze? I don't see any anymore in the chat. All right, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to thank all of our speakers again this, for this morning. And we'll now have a break of half an hour and we'll reconvene at 10.30. Thank you so much.
And um, okay, so uh, the first in 1700 uh, years in that simulation. So now the question is, what if we cap the CO2 before this acceleration? So we are going to do it at three times CO2. So three times is reached at year 111. So it is nine years before that acceleration and see what happens. OK, what do you think? Do you have much of hope? <laughs> no? No, people don't have hope. Uh, yes, have hope. For, uh, uh, two thirds of the, the reduction of, of the melt rates is by two thirds. So we are left one, one third of the rate. So mitigation works. <laughs> uh, so uh, we are averting this uh, acceleration that is happening uh, at year 120. You have in the vertical line. Um, so, OK, so I am prov providing an assessment here so this will work. But now, yeah, because we are scientists here, we want to see how, what the processes that are behind this reduction. No? OK, so, um, so this is a map of the expansion of the ablation area. That is everything that is not yellow. Uh, here, so when we are at the year 500, 43% uh, of the villain acid area is uh, ablation area. So it has a color, green or blue, in three times CO2, but it's 70% in the case of four times CO2. So, um, OK, so what I'm going to do for the analysis, I'm going to um, have a look for the components of the mass balance of the acid, the components of the energy balance that is providing the energy for the melt, and I'm going to tie all of that to elevations. So how much mass loss comes from each elevation so that I can tie ablation area changes in area to the overall mass loss. Because my suspicion or my first hypothesis would be that, that this uh, a massive expansion of the ablation area is what is causing the, the super acceleration. But maybe I am wrong. Uh, yeah. I'm wrong. This is the spoiler. Okay, so here you have the evolution of the components of the mass balance. So if you look at the first 100 years, we have an SMB that is positive by, by the end of so by year 100, it becomes uh, zero and it goes uh, the way uh, to negative. It is the black line that I am following in both uh, uh, three times and four times. Um, um, now uh, we are going to move to the year 500. And when we are at year 500, uh, we can see that snowfall rates are not very different. Snow melt is not very different, but we have a huge difference in the melt of bare ice that is exposed uh, uh, in the melt season at the point that all of the accumulation of the snow of the winter is, is gone. Um, um, two simulations. Okay, so it's about the bare ice melt. And now I'm going to look at the energy. So the black line is the total melt energy. And uh, it is uh, 60 watts per square meter by year 500 in three times and uh, double in four times CO2. And um, so what we see is that uh, in both simulations, all of the fluxes are in increasing, the, the two radiative fluxes and the two uh, turbulent fluxes. But, um, the long wave is increasing very um, linearly in time, but this is not the case for the short wave because of the albedo effect um, that is very, very strong in four times CO2. So you can see this line for the albedo decline. And, um, and also the turbulent fluxes, they, they increase very, very much. Um, by year 120, so there is an acceleration with these fluxes. So most of the differences in the melt energy are coming from sensible uh, heat flux, and then the second contributor is uh, is the solar because the albedo is much lower in four times CO2. Um, okay, so now I am going to move to look at elevation. I'm going to start for uh, by validating the model. So I'm going to pull out um, data to so the model output for the historical run that is coupled, and I'm going to compare it with data from the stations of IMAO along the K-transect 
that is in southwestern Greenland, which is the area with the, the larger, the widest uh, uh, ablation uh, area at the moment. Um, uh, you can see that the gradient of uh, SMB or the gradient of ablation rates in the ablation area uh, with elevation are very well captured by our model. Uh, so we reproduce this uh, four meter per year uh, decrease in um, uh, ablation per kilometer of elevation uh, uh, change. No? So as we go up, the ablation rates are very much reduced. Okay, so this is a very good start. And now we are gonna go directly to year 500, that is this very dramatic year in the simulation. And, and now we are looking at the full ice sheet, not at a transect, but the beams of elevation of 100 meters. So, and uh, we are gonna look at the um, average melt rate per elevation uh, beam. Um, we can see, uh, first of all, a linear relationship between ablation rate and elevation. And second of, of it, we see that the ablation rates are much larger in four times CO2. That, so this gradient is much larger in four times CO2. And we can also see that the, the differences in the melt rates are much larger in the low elevations than they are at the higher elevations. Okay, so now introducing time, so I have um, elevation in the Y and in the X I have time and I have these beautiful colors to represent a, a mass loss rates per elevation uh, in the units of meters per year. And now you have the time series of the evolution of the, of the gradient and you can see that in year 120, the, the gradient for four times CO2 is increasing very much. Okay, so now I need to weight all these meter per year ablation rates by area. Um, so what I'm plotting here is the, the so-called hypsometry of the ice set. So it is the cumulative uh, area of the ice set that I have below a certain elevation. So um, what is very remarkable here is that for all of the three times CO2 simulation and for four times CO2 until year 500, this hypsometry remains more or less constant. So this is super handy. Um, uh, and another thing that you can infer from here is that there is uh, much less area at low elevation than there is at higher elevation. So below 1,000 meters, we only have 10% of the ice edge. Okay, so now I'm gonna do the derivative. So I go back to my beams. And so you can see again how the weight in the aerial weight of the low elevation areas is small compared to the weight above uh, 1500 meters. Okay, so now I'm gonna, uh, gonna combine these aerial weights with the, uh, uh, with the um, ablation rates and also the total area of the ice set because it is different in four times CO2, the area is going down much faster. I put it all together, I'm gonna go back to my beams and this is what I get. So now, um, it is not so clear that most, uh, whether, yeah, so we have here uh, uh, two peaks in, uh, in uh, mass loss, and they are the result of different weighting of having more area and less uh, ablation rate or having a higher ablation rate uh, at low elevation, but less of area. No? So then we can see these peaks by elevation 1,000 and 1,500. And now if I am uh, summing up uh, all the mass loss that is happening above the equilibrium line altitude of three times CO2, I see that the extra melting four, time, uh, four times CO2 is only 23% of the total extra mass loss that is going on there with respect to three times CO2. So the expansion of the so the, the colonization of new elevations in four times CO2 in terms of uh, sea level rise doesn't make a lot of an effect because what, what, where the real action is going on is in the common ablation area where the melt rates are much, much, much higher in four times CO2. We're talking about 
uh, a, nine, uh, a, a, a global uh, warming level of nine Kelvin in that simulation, and this is bringing a lot of energy to any of the areas over the ice edge. And this is what makes the big, big difference. Okay, so this is the summary slide with the conclusion. So, um, number one, my, my, uh, I'm, I'm gonna give you three points. So the number one co conclusion, and in the context of actionable science, so um, mitigation <laughs> works. So uh, the, the effects of global warming do not scale linearly with the level of warming. So a reduction of emissions make a huge impact. Uh, so mass loss acceleration is avoided by capping at the three times CO2, at least in this model. Um, second uh, take point uh, message, um, the expansion of ablation area at a higher elevation has a relatively minor effect on the total mass loss. So we better look at the common ablation area and how things are evolving there. Uh, so for instance, at which point in the melt season uh, their ice is exposed. Yeah, so, uh, the timing of that uh, is very important and makes a huge difference in uh, the total energy budget. Um, and the uh, third point is that uh, technically is that here we have developed a framework uh, for the community to relate ICED mass loss uh, and elevation. And uh, I uh, leave you with an application of that uh, to the refreshing uh, story. So here we can, we can trace, uh, okay, we have more or less the same amount of refreshing by year 500 in the two simulations. And why is that? And uh, this, yeah, uh, we can see that there are um, some uh, differences there. So in, uh, in four times CO2, this refreshing is happening above the equilibrium line altitude, while in three times uh, CO2 is, uh, uh, is more distributed um, above and below the equilibrium line altitude. Okay, uh, I take your questions. This thing on? Okay. Um, that was really interesting, the 3x CO2 work. So for the 4x CO2, I think you said it takes 1,700 years to completely get rid of the ice sheet, is that right? Yes. What do you think it would be for a 3x CO2? Or you're not, have you not done that calculation? Uh, it's okay. I was just wondering if it's double or if it's quadruple, so, you know, good so we, we also have a two times CO2 and for two times CO2, mm, uh, you have to ask Michele Petrini, so he has some simulations that are with CISM offline for with SMB from CSM, and he can tell you more about uh, these kind of scales of uh, uh, deglaciation, but I can tell you that we did also two times CO2 and we already closed the, 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 the the point for the glaciation, so the ice is gone, and I think the time scale would be something like 7,000 years for two times CO2. So, so here, yeah, I don't know, it should be something around 5,000, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Hola. If anybody has questions uh, done online, please go ahead. No? Otherwise, we move on. Okay, so um, so the next uh, speaker will be presenting also on Greenland and its city uh, and. Uh, She's online. So, um, can you please share your presentation? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, try that again. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, sir. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, now I'm going to share the screen. Cool. 
We don't hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, now? How about now? Yeah. Can you speak a okay. little bit? Uh, uh, I guess. Louder. Uh, how about now? Uh, a little bit better. Can you force it a little bit more? Oh, okay. Let me try. Um, okay. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Please. Yeah. Uh, Hi everyone from China. Uh, I'm uh, Zikian from, uh, I'm a, a graduate student from uh, CU Boulder. And today I'm going to talk about uh, some uh, results from the uh, a simulate, a set of simulations uh, of uh, uh, my uh, current project. So as the map shows, uh, Greenland actually is surrounded by the, uh, this, uh, it has this, uh, steep topographic gradients at its the acid margins and also uh there are um the blazing zones are uh, can be as narrow as tens of kilometers and it is hard to resolve by one to two, two degree uh, global climate models and previous this is a result from previous simulations a uh, previous uh paper by adam at ncar that's it shows the uh, precipitation precipitation basis uh, from a set of uh, di some uh, different simulations using um, C set CSM with um, different horizontal resolution grade, uh, and it, it shows that uh, gradient is very uh, gradient clouds and precipitation is very sensitive to um, is very sensitive to uh, the grade resolution with uh, in lower resolutions the topographic of Greenland is too smooth and it lets too much moisture to penetrate into the acid interior and created this uh, positive precipitation basis uh, over the Greenland acid. So we need a higher, a fine spatial resolution to resolve this narrow ablation zones and topographic gradients. And also because of the current uh, mass loss of Greenland is driven by both atmosphere and oceanic warming. So we also need a coupled uh, model framework. So this leads to uh, the, uh, our model uh, configuration that use coupled CSM and CISM uh, with a dynamic uh, gradient as sheet included. And also based on this uh, one degree spectral element grade, uh, uh, variable resolution grade was developed, uh, which has a quarter degree uh, regional refinement over Arctic region. Um, and these are some basic information about the simulation. Oh, sorry. And uh, this variable resolution uh, grade was applied to the atmosphere and land, land component. The resolution of the ice sheet model uh, is the de by default is four kilometers. And this is also the first time that the ocean uh, model was coupled to the variable resolution grid. And compared to a regional climate model, our strat strategy uh, has a unified and coupled model infra infrastructure that enables the two-way uh, interactions between the um, refined region and the rest of the globe. And also it doesn't need any boundary conditions. And compared to a global high resolution simulation, our strategy can greatly re reduce the computational cost. So, uh, and in this study, we focus on first the evolution of the green ash sheet. And also we want to investigate uh, the effect of this enhanced uh, horizontal resolution. So we compare our variable resolution simulation result with two, uh, two CSM uh, fully coupled simulations uh, using the uh, one degree finite volume, one, gre one degree grade uh, with the finite, uh, finite volume dynamical core. And the first one is from uh, Laura Montgomery's uh, 2020 paper. And because the, uh, the code base uh, they use for the simulation has uh, a trick to put some code ring uh, into, uh, into a surface runoff to reduce the surface mass balance basis. Uh, so we run uh, another new simulation uh, with this one, uh, with the finite volume one degree grade, uh, with the same code base as our uh, variable resolution run. 
Uh, so we start the simulation. Uh, we first start a pre-industrial control scenario for 180 years until the ash sheet uh, achieves near equilibrium state. And then from the end of this, uh, we run this uh, idealized scenario in which the atmosphere CO2 increase by 1% per year until after 140 years, uh, it, uh, it um, uh, achieves four times the pre-industrial value and runs for another 210 years. And the bottom panel shows the uh, average temperature for the global Arctic and gradient ice sheet uh, evolution. Um, so by this kind of uh, forcing scenario, before um, before 140 years, uh, we have this near linear increasing uh, warming trend. And we uh, found a smaller temperature increase of the Greenland ash sheet compared to Arctic because Greenland ash sheet is a, a terrestrial region with this perennial uh, ice snow surface. And then uh, we first look at the uh, some time series. Uh, and first we look at into the uh, different mass balance terms. So we found this uh, acceleration uh, similar to the one degree run uh, the mass loss of gradient ash sheet accelerates after about a hundred years, and this we see this um, uh, mass this mass balance uh, trend is dominated by the surface mass balance trend uh, in yellow, and then we look at in uh, we look the uh, different surface mass balance components. Uh, we found that the uh, surface melt trend is the dominant. Uh, dominant component for um, in in red for the um, surface mass balance trend, and then from the uh, surface energy uh, balance pers perspective, we calculated uh, the change of different surface energy balance terms, and we found that uh, before about a hundred and fifty years, the long term uh, long wave radiation's contribution uh, is the largest. Um, because of the atmospheric warming. And then after that, we see this increase of this, uh, the blue line, which represents uh, the net solar radiation. And it becomes the largest contributor to this additional melting energy and, and this acceleration of this rises. And this is because of what we call the, uh, uh, the, else, the ice albedo feedback is triggered on and it's, uh, is what uh, Miriam just covered in her talk. Uh, as the um, we see a expansion of this ablation area of the Greenland ice sheet uh, in this right line, and it can also be seen from these uh, maps. So this uh, maps the first line shows the albedo um, variation, and this uh, for the pre-industrial um, uh, period and the CO2 stabilization period, and this is the end of the simulation. And the second line shows the surface mass balance variations. We see this uh, expansion of this of the ablation area in red, um, and because of this uh, surface melting in the ablation area, more darker uh, darker surface ex was exposed, like a uh, bare ice. Uh, which uh, absorbs more solar radiation and promotes uh, further melting and of the, uh, over these red regions. And this shows the uh, changes of this uh, through periods compared to the pre-industrial period. And we see the uh, albedo decreases was um, most uh, extensive um, uh, it decreased most uh, in this acid margins. And also another region for uh, that explains this faster uh, expansion of this ablation zones is that because of the acid uh, shape is near parabolic, so it favors faster expansion of the ablation area uh, as the temperature rises. Uh, and because we use uh, this 
coupled model framework, uh, we can analyze the evolution of the ice sheet. So we also look into the ice, uh, ice sheet thickness changes and its surface velocity changes. Uh, we see this extensive thinning around uh, the ice sheet ablation areas in red. And also, um, also in this, from the ice sheet interior towards the ice sheet margins, we detect this um, uh, acceleration of the ice sheet surface because of the, um, the, the surface slope of the um, ice sheet. Uh, because of the ice sheet thickness changes, becomes steeper and it, it drives faster um, ice flows in these blue regions. And then the next part of this um, of this talk will focus on the comparison of the Arctic of the resolution run compared to um, the one degree resolution runs. Sorry. So these maps compare the uh, time series of surface mass balance, mass balance, and sea level rises. And we see that the Arctic run has a smaller, a smaller mass loss increases and thus um, smaller contribution to sea level rise. And this is primarily because the Arctic run have a smaller increase in melting. And in other words, uh, the one degree runs um, melt uh, too much. And then uh, we look at into the uh, maps. So um, we see this, we compare uh, the one degree resolution run with the Arctic run uh, in this, uh, the melt differences uh, in these two columns. And we found that um, in these three periods, um, the two a uh, one degree run have a larger melt uh, compared to the, have a similar pattern of larger melt compared to the Arctic run. And this can uh, result, this results in uh, ice sheet um, uh, thinning as much as three to four uh, hundred meters in this uh, red regions. And so we are curious about uh, like what uh, precisely caused this uh, uh, differences between the Arctic run and the F09 uh, one degree runs, what causes a, a smaller uh, melt increases in the variable resolution uh, run. So we first in, uh, look into a uh, large scale uh, climate. Uh, so this map shows the uh, Northern hemisphere, summer, lower temperature, uh, troposphere, virtual temperature differences between the Arctic run, between the uh, one degree run and the Arctic run. Uh, and we found that uh, the uh, both of the one degree run have this um, cooler troposphere temperature compared to the Arctic run, uh, except for uh, this uh, for the during the steel to civilization period over the Greenland ice sheet and the Canadian Arctic archipelago that it has a warmer uh, troposphere. And then we look into the uh, surface, near surface temperature differences. We found that uh, the near surface temperature differences doesn't uh, coincide with the um, uh, lower troposphere water temperature differences. And it has more like, spatial variations. If we zoom into uh, the green and ash sheet, so this first two column uh, is the same that's showing the melt differences between these runs. If we zoom into the Greenland ash sheet, uh, the near surface temperature difference pattern is different from this uh, melt difference patterns, at least for this uh, dark red regions. So we can conclude that the warmer temperature uh, is not the dominant factor that causes the larger melt of the, uh, of the lower resolution runs. And then we look at into the surface albedo changes. Uh, we see uh, the, the pattern of this albedo changes uh, is very similar uh, in this uh, dark red regions with the larger melt of the lower, of the lower resolution run. So uh, we conclude 
the lower surface albedo after uh, F09, after, after one degree run, um, enhances the absorbed solar radiation and causing this larger melt, at least for this, uh, uh, this red regions. And to conclude, uh, so similar to the uh, lower multiverse paper, we found that green and ashy mass loss accelerates after about 100 years, which is caused by the rapidly increasing surface melt as the ablation area expands and associated ice albedo feedback. Uh, and by comparing our uh, the variable, variable resolution simulation with the one degree simulations, we found uh, the Arctic grade run has smaller summer melt and so slower mass loss. And this is primarily due to a uh, smaller uh, as albedo feedback. And we are still uh, looking into the causes for these differences. So the next steps are uh, to further compare these different uh, simulations and explain the differences. And also to include uh, other interactions and uh, like the effects on atmosphere and ocean oceanic circulations. Uh, thanks for your attention. And I'm happy to answer questions. No additional for questions. Um, hi, Ziki, it's Michelle. Hi, hi, hi Michelle. China. <laughs> um, oh, great talk. Yeah. I was wondering if, in addition to looking at some of the longer term trends in melt, you also looked at year to year variability in the amount of surface melt um, at those different points in the simulation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I, I haven't looked into the like year to year variation so far. Um, yeah, we'll okay. maybe look at Thanks. it in the future. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think Heiko has a question. Heiko, oh. can you? Uh, yes, can you hear me well? Yes, very yeah, well. Yeah, I can hear thank you. you. Yeah. Thanks for a good talk. Um, I was wondering, so you show that, um, melt and albedo have a similar pattern which i guess makes sense because there's a feedback between the two do you have an idea of what kind of experiments you could do to distinguish or to, or to find out the the driving mechanism behind that because i imagine when melt increases albedo decreases and when albedo decreases melt increases so how do you decouple the two processes yeah uh yeah i think that's a very good question um i, I think now i i don't know how to like uh Vicky, we cannot hear you oh sorry can you uh hear me now yeah okay yeah i think uh, so i think that's a very good question and uh so far, I I don't know like how to, uh, in, uh, how to, uh, like run simulations to, uh, to test that. Uh, I think I will like look into uh, how to do that. Yeah, thanks. That's great. I, I yeah. also don't know it. It's thanks. it's a real question. So um yeah. yeah, interesting to think about it. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question in the room. Hi, um it's Ute. So I think you should Hi. not totally decouple albedo and melting you can decouple like the sources of albedo physically because as the melting surface changes the albedo naturally changes then you want to model separately the albedo changes that come from say dust storms or other atmospheric fallouts or smoke plumes or so forth which can be atmospheric defects but you don't want to like decouple processes entirely that are physically linked just sort of my thinking 
right? You want to look at the sources of ultimate change. It's not a variable in itself in that way. I mean, it's a maybe that's the wrong way to phrase it. You want to look at the sources that make the ultimate change. Good thing I'm not a model. But now thanks for the, the atmospheric the effects right now from Calypso, actually, which is a satellite where you get atmospheric observations. And specifically, we are pulling out um, aerosols from smoke and other things which have been too thin to be detected in the LiDAR, but they affect the radiative fluxes. So that affects the melt and the altitude. Thank you yeah. very much. We are uh, going to the move advice. to the next speaker. Uh, she's in the room. It's uh, three data. Hi, um, I'm Tridata. Thanks for joining me on this last day of the Warriors. <laughs> I'd like to, so today I'm going to be talking about global sources of moisture for atmospheric rivers over Antarctica. Sorry, what? Oh, what? Um, okay, there Thank you. Okay, we're back. Um, so I'll start again. Um, I'm Tree Dada. I am a research associate at University of Colorado Boulder. And today I'm going to be talking about the global sources of moisture for atmospheric rivers over Antarctica. And this is using a variable resolution CSM2. So I want to thank all my co-authors here, as well as a bunch of other people who have been really helpful about answering questions in terms of setting up the experiment. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about why this is important, and I'm just using the last few years as a sort of context. So what I'm showing here is a uh, it's a plot. This is a figure from from the uh, band state of the climate in Antarctica and the Southern Ocean. So it's uh, something I contribute to as well as the Ziki Yin who spoke earlier and Michelle McClellan is in the audience. And um, the top plot, what this is showing is the surface mass balance over the last 40 years. And in fact, 2022 is a uh, is a new record. 
So that's sort of unusual. Now, if we think about why that happened, where that happened, first of all, um, I'll direct you to the uh, map in the center bottom. And what that's showing is, and that's the percentage of SMB anomaly, and it's well over 50% in certain parts of East Antarctica as well as West Antarctica. And the reason why that happened is because of atmospheric rivers. And we know this because if we look at the bottom right, this is uh, the, uh, uh, the anomaly of the number of AR days that occurred over the year. We have these same kind of like this anomaly of, of atmospheric rivers occurring in East Antarctica and West Antarctica. So in short, this entire SMB anomaly that was, you know, produced this very dramatic effect is something that happened just because of a few events. So these events are very, pretty important. So, you know, another thing that's kind of happened over the last um, year, in fact, well, actually from 2016, is that we've seen a reduction in sea ice. So year after year, we see, keep seeing new um, record lows. And in fact, 2023, um, you know, the, this is showing in March and May of sea ice extent. And that's at a new record low, so that's been pretty dramatic. But another thing to keep in mind is that it's been an, it's been, uh, an El Nino conditions for the last, I can't remember, three or four years, and, and we're hitting a El Nino condition that's really dramatic. So a lot is going on in the ocean and the atmosphere, and this, this can potentially have a lot of effects on Antarctica. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what we know to kind of contextualize my work here. And so this is a... Uh, uh, sort of a, a 3D model of, of an idealized ice sheet. Um, it has no courtesy because I made this. Um, and so many of the things that we know. So we know that precipitation high elevations comes from lower latitudes. And this is from a paper by Hai Long Wang in 2020, which had a similar moisture tagging experiment to what I'm doing here. Um, as well as that the majority of precipitation comes from the Southern Ocean, which is a very high latitude, so that's nearby. But the Pacific and Indian Oceans from low latitudes. We also know that there's an observed link between Pacific and West Antarctic surface mass balance. And this is from a paper that is currently in review, leading with which I'm a part of, that is uh, led by Luke Trussell. And we know that reduced elevation lead, can lead to greater moisture intrusions, and that's by Hansi Singh and uh, Parvani in 2020. Um, the other thing that's going to be really relevant to an experiment here is that sea ice loss leads to enhanced precipitation. Um, this is again from Hailong Lang. And then um, the question of what I'm doing here in the land, land ice working group, because I've, you know, the, the components that I'm thinking about here are ocean, sea ice, uh, atmosphere. But how this affects land ice in particular is that this, the enhanced precipitation of an atmospheric river can lead to greater precipitation of the center of the continent, but it also brings heat. And so that melt can actually impact, uh, especially the ice shelves that surround Antarctica. And what I'm showing here are these two sort of diagrams, which are emphasizing the way the surface melt can lead to hydrofracture and potentially um, damaging ice shelves on the exterior. So the main questions I'm going to be talking about here are how do we differentiate ocean sources of large scale precipitation from extremes? And one such extreme, or one thing we can capture is an atmospheric river. And the second is how do we attribute impacts such as the differences in extremes and moisture sources to drivers, such as patterns of sea ice concentration and sea surface temperature? And that's pretty preliminary, so you know, please feel free to have questions afterwards. So the major tool I'm using is variable resolution CSM2. And Fortunately, Ziki gave a really great introduction to this is a very similar um, configuration, except the, uh, the Southern Ocean and Antarctica are, are um, refined in this case at a quarter degree resolution. And to just get a picture of what that means in, some, in terms of the topography of the Antarctic Peninsula, I'm showing the map here on the right. So this is an AMIP style simulation, so that means it's forced sea ice concentration and sea surface temperatures, so those are coming from data. Um, and I have a historical run that's from 1979 to 2020. But for the 2000 to 2010 period of implemented moisture tagging, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, there are also three hourly outputs, which captures at, for both the atmosphere and ice sheet surface, which allows us to capture atmospheric rivers. But also very important um, is that, that these can also force fern models. So forcing the fern model, the fern model in, within um, in uh, CLM is is you know under development, but it's you know it's what's appropriate for an ESM. It's, it's, the uh, outputs here could force a more sophisticated fern model. This is all in a paper that is uh, currently in review, and so I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail about the validation here, except to talk about so what some of the biases are. So what I'm showing here is the impacts of enhanced resolution, and this is comparing ANSI, which is what I've called the enhanced resolution simulation, with the AMIT uh, GOGA simulation, which is at one degree. And so these differ by both DICOR and by uh, resolution, but please trust me that it's, it's actually the resolution that makes a difference. And the major effects that we have is that we have enhanced SMB when we expand the resolution, and that's largely because of large-scale precipitation that occurs in winter. 
and this is you know the lands over the the uh, um, Antarctic ice, especially East Antarctica, but also over the Southern Ocean. So you know there's a couple some of some of those biases are you know that are present in winter are not actually present in summer. So there's in fact a drying effect, which is um, I think something Adam had discussed at length. And uh, but we also have an integrated uh, uh, meridional vapor transport, which is moisture that's being directed towards the poles, which is enhanced. So these biases are can potentially be sort of leveraged to uh, understand the sensitivity of things like atmospheric rivers, which are by definition moisture that is sourced from lower latitudes towards higher latitudes. So just as a quick uh, description of what this is, an atmospheric river is, uh, as defined here, is a uh, is meridional moisture transfer. You add up all the moisture in a moisture column and that is being directed towards the poles, and then you find the top uh, 98th percentile of, of those that uh, the value and where they're connected, where they form a river um, that expands over 20 degrees latitude, we call that an atmospheric river. And intuitively, if we look at this image here from 2017, um, this is an atmospheric river. It pretty much captures what's going on. You know, that's being directed towards Antarctica. So the moisture tagging map that I'm using, what this is capturing is for any precipitation, for any any precipitation that occurs on the globe, did it come from any one of these tags? So these tags are sort of divided to capture the oceans and then subdivided further to divide the Eastern Pacific and the Western Pacific, but then also in latitude bands. So a lot of the reason for this was that was to capture the maximum amount of variability for places that, that should theoretically behave differently um, while uh, limiting the tags that are necessary because it adds a lot of computational cost, um, which is why you know, I haven't run it over 40 years. So the first thing is the sources for precipitation over Antarctica for 2000 to 2010. So let's pretend like this is a, a baseline condition. I'm just showing fall, but for, you know most of the other seasons are identical. So the main thing I'm showing here, well, actually, let me explain what this is. So the percentage tells you of the precipitation that landed on um, the Antarctic ice sheet, what percentage came from that moisture tag region. So it's not correcting for area. So this isn't, this shouldn't be seen as a, a a sort of uh, one value from one region applies to the other. Um, so basically what we're seeing here is the importance of the Eastern Pacific Ocean because it's really bright red. It's about 8% of moisture that lands on Antarctica came from the Eastern Pacific Ocean. But also the importance of that, that uh, band that's from uh, 35 to 55 degrees. So that's pretty important. We kind of expect the Southern Ocean to be important, but you know this region is also pretty, pretty important here. Now the second question is, how do the moisture sources when an atmospheric river is detected differ from large scale precipitation. And there are a couple of things that are kind of intuitive here. The first is that an atmospheric river is by its definition, a moisture that's coming from lower latitudes. So that means where it's lower, where we're seeing it blue, that means that there's a, a lesser contribution of total moisture. Um, and so we could expect the, the Southern Ocean is going to contribute a little bit less. But we see, we see during summer an enhanced contribution of the Eastern Pacific and the Atlantic, um, and a reduced contribution between, on, on portions of the Indian Ocean. What's interesting is in winter, you have a reduced contribution of the Atlantic, and that really dramatic effect of the Eastern Pacific really isn't as strong. Um, and there's also a little bit of variability in terms of, you know, the, or, you know, in terms of what the contribution of the Western Pacific is. So in terms of the relative importance of ARs, what this is showing is the amount of precipitation total for large-scale precipitation um, that is, that is, uh, can be attributed to an atmospheric river occurring the day of, or, the, or precipitation that occurs the day of, or the day after an atmospheric river occurred on that area. And what this kind of tells you is that, for example, the droning Mogland region in East Antarctica um, has a pretty high contribution, it's about 12% um, in this model. And so there's been some work done with CSM Classic and the One Degree Model by Michelle McLennan, which is showing very similar values, but that this is even more important in winter. So I'll come back to this in a second. Um, we're now gonna be moving on to an experiment um, that uh, we've done here to understand what is the impact of a recurrent anomaly pattern of reduced sea ice. And this is capturing the enhanced sea ice loss that's occurred since 2016. So to start off with, this is a, a paper that is uh, currently in review as well, um, led by Lou Trussell and I'm, I'm including this as well. And what this is showing here, what I want to point you to, um, is this is from observations alone, looking at the correlation between sea ice concentration and surface mass balance. So this is you know, over the last 40 years. And what we can see is that where it's brown on, the, con on uh, the continent, that means that within the section that's kind of marked off, that there's an anti-correlation between sea ice concentration and um, surface mass balance. 
So this is true in every single sector except for the Indian Ocean. So kind of in, in part kind of inspired by this, um, ran into a, a great talk at NCAR. This is by uh, David Bonin, who's a graduate student right now at Caltech and nuts his head. Um, and he's got a paper that's currently in review in which is discussing the patterns, low frequency patterns of sea, of sea ice um, around Antarctica. And that produced some things that are pretty interesting because um, one of the patterns looked, it was very, very strong after 2016, it's associated with La Nina, as well as a position of the immense sea blow. And I won't get into that. I'd recommend this paper, I think it's pretty great. But this pattern that you're seeing here, the anomaly itself in terms of uh, percentage, we took that, applied it to every single month, found the corresponding uh, sea surface temperature anomaly, and then applied that to the 2000, 2010 mean. So what this means is that if we look at the different, if we create this synthetic year based on the anomaly, not just what happened since 2016, but this particular kind of pattern, then we can see what the differences are for atmospheric rivers as well as um, for a large scale circulation. So um, one of the first things is, is the impact of sea ice decline that I'm showing fall alone. Um, and the, some things that, that are kind of interesting is if you think about this other notion, you have reduced sea ice. So you have reduced sea ice, you're going to expect that more moisture is going to be able to flux in the atmosphere, and that might be captured by atmospheric rivers. Um, and actually, no, I should explain the difference here. So this is the relative uh, proportion that that map for ARs only from the experiment versus the large scale condition. So this is kind of change. Well, how does how do the behavior of ARs change when you reduce sea ice? So we're seeing a reduced uh, impact from the Atlantic Ocean and uh, from the Western Pacific and enhanced uh, importance of the Indian Ocean. But also this kind of points to something that's interesting. You, you reduce sea ice and that means that you have more of this flux occurring uh, around Antarctica. So it's not simply that an atmospheric river starts from somewhere else. It means where does it pick up moisture along the way, including that like the 35 to 55 degrees south band that's well beyond the, the perimeter of sea ice. So if we look at the total impact of uh, sea ice decline in fall, and this is in that five-year ensemble, so you know there is a mean here. Um, when sea ice is reduced, what this is showing is the total number of gigatons that were added in the experiment as compared to that mean. And this is showing uh, nearly 20 gigatons more of precipitation added in the, the center of East Antarctica. So quite a, this, this um, I, will, I won't say that this is entirely robust, but it was sort of exciting because it may, may might be sort of reproducing some of the conditions of where we have this sort of an extreme in East Antarctica. Um, okay, and so the, the second part of that is how much of that can be attributed to atmospheric rivers? So similar to the first sort of map that was that I showed, um, this is the uh, difference in the percentage of precipitation that can be attributed to ARs for the, the uh, experimental condition versus the mean. And exactly where we have more precipitation is exactly where we have more ARs. So in fact, the ARs are driving this. So I kind of want to conclude here with, rather than giving conclusions, this is what I've, what I've looked at so far and what I'm going to be looking at in the future, and also just generally what I think the important questions are. So I'm connecting source to sink, and the sinks in particular, where, where the precipitation lands, it really matters where it lands. There's places where precipitation is more important. For example, um, if we're talking about West Antarctica, there is a point in the future where we might have a phase shift where we have more rain. That makes a difference where, where ice loss is, is likely to happen more um, readily. So I focused on ocean regions that are impacted by El Nino and, and La Nina. Then the La Nina condition, so far I'm very likely to do El Nino as well. Um, and also just high latitude regions where, which are impacted by sea ice decline and how that changes. Now in terms of sinks, I uh, focused on large scale precipitation over Antarctica, but not over the ocean. And this is pretty important because where, where you have enhanced snow and rain, um, over the Southern Ocean, that can impact that, you know, for the precise question that I'm thinking about, that can, you know, impact the, uh, the amount of moisture that's available for large scale precipitation over Antarctica kind of on a second leg. So there, there can be, you know, entrainment more because of precipitation that landed there earlier. The other thing is that the only kind of extreme that I've looked at here is, in, is an atmospheric river. So there's another way, there's another, you know, possible value in, in this particular setup, which is saying, you have an extreme, if you measure an extreme by a threshold, is it associated with an atmospheric river? And if not, where did that moisture come from? Is there some other mechanism of having these extremes? And because these, these runs are so expensive, this is something that um, I found is pretty interesting to a lot of people in the AR community is, you know, they don't have a setup that's able to answer this question, and this is kind of a setup that's fine. So I think with that, I've run over time, so <laughs> I'll stop here. Thank you.
question? Great. Anybody? <laughs> Okay, go ahead, Michelle. <laughs> um, really cool talk, Tree. I was wondering, so some of Jonathan Willey's research, for example, more recently has shown that ARs can help to induce sea ice loss as like a direct effect, for example, at the peninsula. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on some of the two-way feedbacks between those processes in the short term. That's a, that's a very good question, and in fact, it was kind of the inspiration for looking at the ocean. Um, yeah, I think it matters. Um, so far, you know, this is focused on ARs that land on, on the ice. What happens when they hand, and land on sea ice? What happens when they land, land on the ocean? Um, and yeah, I think that's worthwhile. I think that, that simply, it's almost like if you took an atmospheric river and you divided it up, you know, is the atmospheric river, you know, preconditioning? That's one, one question. It's not the one that you were getting at, but is it preconditioning uh, the, the uh, surroundings for greater moisture intrusion afterwards? But then, yeah, that's true. This, I think that the same run, and you know, I'm not going to be answering all questions. These runs are going to be available, and if people want to look at that, then yeah, I'm looking to you. you know, then you're welcome to, and please reach out to me. Thanks, Drew. Yeah. Anybody else? So we are moving to the last speaker today. Um, he's online, uh, I, I hope. Alex, uh, uh, Alex Huth will be presenting on uh, giant icebergs. Okay. Is this screen sharing properly? Yes, sir. All right. Okay. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, today I'm going to talk about methods that we have developed at GFDL to represent large tabular bergs and their breakup in Earth system models where they currently aren't represented at all. There is some interest in adding bergs to CESM, so hopefully this talk will serve as a high-level overview of what is possible. Oops. Um, I'll specifically talk about how breakup affects where icebergs drift and deposit meltwater into the ocean, and also talk about the December 2020 breakup of iceberg A68 shown here, which I will model. Icebergs influence climate by transporting about half of the freshwater flux from ice sheets to wherever they drift and melt in the ocean, which can be thousands of kilometers away, as shown in this model output at right of the meltwater flux from icebergs to the ocean. The meltwater can affect sea ice formation, ocean circulation, and biological productivity, uh, particularly as a source of iron to the iron-limited southern ocean. At GFDL, Icebergs are modeled as Lagrangian point particles. We take the flux of land ice from uh, into the ocean and convert it into iceberg particles with various sizes. They have a cuboid geometry uh, where the length and width and thickness changes with melt along the sides and the base, as well as wave erosion on the sides. And this geometry also aids in determining its force balance that causes it to drift, where the main forces are a pressure gradient force, the Coriolis force, and drag terms from ocean currents, wind, and sea ice. Uh, in this form, the particles do not interact with each other, meaning they don't bounce off each other or contact each other. Iceberg size is important because it dictates where icebergs drift and deposit freshwater into the ocean. Large bergs tend to drift farther, and giant tabular bergs, while there's only a few of them in the ocean at any time, uh, those with areas greater than 100 square kilometers represent 90% of Antarctic iceberg volume. So these plots at the base here show the iceberg trajectories. On the left is the observed trajectories for areas between 5 and 11,000 square kilometers. And in the middle is the default GFDL uh, output when using berg areas that are under three and a half square kilometers, which is the default, but it's 
several orders of magnitude too small for those sizes. Nevertheless, we can get a nice match to the observed trajectories, but given that these bergs are so small, the decay rates and therefore the meltwater flux and its distribution in the ocean must be somewhat incorrect. Uh, but if we use larger bergs, they tend to drift to too low of latitudes. And the reason being that we don't have a representation of their breakup. So the goal here is to be able to put breakup into the model and these larger icebergs and therefore get the decay rates and meltwater distribution correct. So I'm going to try to fit two studies into the rest of my time here, um, but I'll just briefly go over the first study where the goal is to uh, add these large bergs and their breakup due to um, the footloose mechanism into global climate models. The footloose mechanism being the eroding off of small bergs from the edges of a larger berg. And then the second study will be looking at a second form of breakup called rift calving. This is the breakup of a large tabular berg into fragments that are themselves still quite large tabular bergs. And this requires a whole new modeling framework. Footloose mechanism works uh, as follows. A uh, warm ocean will erode at the iceberg edge, leaving this notch, and the freeboard will calve off, leaving this underwater foot. The foot causes the iceberg to bend due to a buoyancy force, and this bending causes internal stresses in the berg that cause a child iceberg to calve off from the edge of the larger parent berg. So the goal here is can we parameterize this process and throw it into our iceberg model with larger bergs and keep them from drifting so far north from Antarctica. So our parameterization um, is pretty simple. We already can track the size of the foot with empirical models for erosion and melt, but then we add this elastic beam theory based parameterization where we can determine from this theory the foot length needed to induce the calving and then also the length of the resulting child berg. And these two characteristic lengths vary with the pr um, material properties of the ice. So in particular, the ice stiffness and yield stress are not all that well known. So we'll vary these in a little parametric study to see their effect on how this model behaves in um, a global simulation. And uh, note also that these characteristic lengths in the ice material properties will determine the overall footloose decay rate. That is how quickly a uh, parent berg will decrease due to the footloose mechanism alone. So the global simulations are, well, after a spin up, they're a 60 year simulation that includes large tabular bergs with a footloose mechanism. The max iceberg size is a thousand square kilometers. So several orders of magnitude greater than what we were using before. We have a coupled ocean and sea ice model component, so that would be MOM6 and SIS2 respectively, but we use JRA55 for runoff and atmospheric forcing. These three plots below are showing the average area of large icebergs, that is between 200 and 1,000 square kilometers here, that drift near each grid point. And as expected, without the footloose mechanism, our large bergs drift uh, to too low of latitudes, but with footloose, uh, there's at least one combination of parameters that gives quite a nice match to observations. So this is quite encouraging. And now let's look at the meltwater fluxes. Uh, at left is the simulated average flux when using the default GFDL iceberg size distribution, that is with areas under three and a half square kilometers. And at right are the melt flux anomalies compared to this small berg simulation. For three experiments that use large bergs and the footloose parameterization, though with different material properties of ice. So these differences in the material properties affect the um, size of the child bergs, as well as the footloose decay rate, which results in different large iceberg trajectories, which are shown in grayscale for each experiment. So with a slow footloose decay rate, you get bergs that uh, go to lower latitudes than with a fast footloose decay rate. So while this footloose rate determines where the child bergs are calved, the size of the child bergs actually matters quite a bit as well. So despite having the slowest and fastest footloose to carry, these have similar melt flux anomalies because they both have characteristically small child bergs that are spread more widely from the coast due to wind, as opposed to this simulation with a medium footloose to carry, which has larger child bergs that are more influenced by ocean currents. So hopefully this just gives you some sort of sense of uh, how breakup and the size of icebergs influences where they drift and deposit meltwater. 
Um, this was published last year in James, if you want to check out more. And this is going to be the, I guess, the new default GFDL approach to modeling icebergs in global simulations, uh, at least in the short term, until the next model that I'm going to talk to is uh, completed more fully. So this next model, uh, again, the point in this talk is that it captures rift calving, um, but uh, this is a whole new iceberg component for our, our models that represents the true size and shape of all bergs. So including bergs that are an order of magnitude larger than the ones previously. So exceeding 10,000 square kilometers, if you so want. Uh, but the point is, is that uh, by representing the true size and shape, we can also calculate the internal iceberg stress and therefore rift calving. And in this talk to the goal, um, we're going to try to simulate the observed drift and breakup of iceberg A68 shown here which drifted for a few years from Larson Sea to South Georgia Island, where the breakup of interest occurred. And we want to figure out what caused that. So here's the new module, the Improved Kinematic Iceberg Dynamics Module, or ICID. Um, it represents true size and shape because now we're using a bonded particle representation of icebergs, where external forcings can vary across the body. Internal stresses are um, calculated on bonds that connect the particles. And if the stress gets too high, the bond will snap, so you can capture rift calving. You can also capture grounding, rotation, contact between bergs, and so on, and uh, get nice simulations like the one shown it right here, where a berg approaches the seamount, grounds on it, breaks into two, and uh, the pieces rotate and drift away. So bonded particle methods are notoriously computationally expensive because the internal bond and contact forces require very small time steps to guarantee that elastic waves don't propagate farther than one particle away over a time step. So we need to increase computational efficiency to use this in a climate model. And we do this with a multiple time stepping scheme where we throw as many forces as possible, basically the external, for external forces on a long time step that's a half hour long and then all of these internal forces that require a small time step, we subcycle with 90 sub steps that are 20 seconds each. Uh, note that the short steps are also where we update particle position. So the long step external forces, they're basically the same as what we were using in the point particle version. Uh, but interestingly, we also evaluate the contact force between different conglomerates of bonded iceberg particles on the long step and this is a spring force proportional to the overlap of the particles. And uh, the reason we do it on the long time step is because it's essential for computational efficiency. If we did it on the sub steps where particle position updates are done, it'd be too expensive because that's where, um, well, we'd have to have a, a new search for particle contact uh, each sub step, and we'd have to transfer bursts between processing elements in parallel each sub step, and that's too expensive. So we do it on the long step. And uh, perhaps it's too much detail to go into all of this, but uh, it's essential for the computational efficiency. Uh, to make it work on the long step, we have to use a small spring constant for stability, and this could cause bergs to overlap. So it's easy to get around that, though. You just increase the length at which particles begin to feel like they're contacting each other, and that avoids the overlap. So just a sort of numerical hack there. On the short steps, uh, model basically behaves like a parallel bond discrete element method. So there's a normal and shear force between these particles that are in the same conglomerate, as well as some torque terms, and the bonds fracture or break when the max tensile stress exceeds the strength of the bond. We also have grounding on the short step, which is a linear grounding law. So our test case shown in this animation is the December 2020 drift and breakup of iceberg gay 68 a there's two breakup events the first happened when the berg seemed to contact the sea floor on its northern tip but the second breakup it's not really clear what caused it so we want to answer that uh note that the second breakup event occurred in water that was much deeper than the iceberg keel so unlike the first breakup event it didn't happen when it hit the sea floor but we note that the skinny part of the berg, this so-called finger, was stuck in, uh, well, it was placed in stronger ocean currents, shown in yellow here, than the rest of the berg at the time of breakup. So we hypothesized that this um, ocean current shear is what caused enough tension along the iceberg body to snap it into pieces. 
This is a breakup mechanism that hasn't been reported previously that we can test with our new methods. And here is what the simulation looks like. We get our bonded particle Berg rotating and drifting correctly. And then it hits this uh, 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 C-mount and breaks. And then the second breaking happens due to ocean current shear because that's all that possibly could cause it in our model. We use external forcings for the simulation from satellite and reanalysis data sets. And encouragingly, we use a tensile bond strength of 18 kilopascals that is similar to the strength calculated in a previous study under similar model assumptions. And indeed, this is efficient enough, about eight seconds to simulate each day of iceberg evolution. So uh, longer bergs, we can assume would be probably more susceptible to this style of breakup since they can overlap a strong and weak current more easily at the same time. And to summarize, there's a lot of advantages to this model representing the true size, shape, and stress of these bergs and capturing rotation, rift cap, and grounding, and so on. But at this point, it's really only useful for some specialized applications, given that we have to tune some more bergs and figure out how to initialize these things. Uh, so in the meantime, I would still recommend using the point particles and footloose uh, approach for generalized use within climate models. The bonded particle model ICID was published last year in Science Advances, if you want to learn more. And the next steps with the model, um, as I mentioned, we need to be able to initialize these things. We would love to be able to cap them directly from ice shelves. So that means actually modeling tabular capping, which is not so straightforward, but we've made some progress in at least using damage mechanics to model rifting here, the rifting that led to A68A from uh, Larson C ice shelf. And that should be published the next few months, I would imagine. And uh, there's some loose plans to displace ocean sea ice with these bonded particle bergs and couple them through the atmosphere, have albedo effects accounted for, melt ponding and hydrofracture and so on and so forth. So uh, it should be a, a nice general um, framework for modeling these giant tabular bergs in the ocean. And with that, I'll conclude and I'll take any questions. Thank you. Hey, so uh, great talk. I was wondering if the um, freshwater fluxes that you showed were enough to impact sea ice. Yeah, so since we didn't have the atmosphere evolving dynamically, we just used JRA 55 forcings. We didn't really look at that because uh, really if it was fully coupled, then we'd be able to get all those fluxes between the ocean sea ice and atmosphere that are needed to model sea ice accurately. But yes, we should look at that in the future. <laughs> we have more questions. Anybody uh, online? I don't have a question, just the feedback. Great work. Uh, thank, thank you, you very much. <laughs> um, so if no question, uh, then we are going to close the part of presentations and Please stay, uh, those are online. Uh, we are going to have a discussion uh, for the Land Ice Working Group. All right.
so thank you again for a great session this morning. And um, we have about 20 minutes or so to have a discussion on any topic of your choosing. These are a few topics that we could think of. What? Everything okay? Okay. Um, that we would like you know, to, to suggest. Um, and there is no rule except like, Let's speak after one another, and uh, so I open the floor. If you're if you're online, I'm sorry I cannot see you, so you can just um, say hey, hey, and uh, and uh, just uh, participate in the conversation. And um, yeah, let's open it up. Um, yeah, microphone would be best. I, I wish we could. Yeah. <laughs> so um, something that, that I would love to see is uh, some of the experiments that I've been doing with, with Antarctica that I just talked about done for mountain glaciers for understanding freshwater variability. So once that is implemented, I think it would be, I mean, <laughs> as much as I hate the phrase actionable science, it's, you know, looking at the sensitivity to uh, large scale drivers to, to warming to, um, but also variability in, in um, other teleconnections, nothing's coming to mind right now, but I think you get the gist. And actually, I think that a lot of conversations throughout this, you know, for the last couple of days have been, how do we design the experiments? What, you know, what ensemble size is necessary? Things like that. I mean, there are a lot of questions on how to design those experiments, and I think we could talk about it and have that be something that the Land Ice Working Group could do. Thanks. Anybody would like to um, comment on this? Go ahead, Betty. I introduced another thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So um, going forward for CMIP 7 and IPCC, there's a number of groups, TIPMIP and other European projects concerned about tipping points. There's no uh, insurance that if you run a four times CO2, you'll reach these tipping points or the models would be ready. For example, will there be enough coupled climate Antarctic ice sheet models ready for the next IPC? So I know uh, Hunter and Bill and I and some of the IS MIP people are talking about um, what if experiments. What if the West Antarctic ice sheet um, disappeared? What would be the remote uh, interactions, teleconnections, and such? And there may be others that involve SISM. So I know ISMIP is thinking about this, but it does relate to what SISM and CSM might do for actionable science. Thinking about uh, that's just one example, and there's others that have to do with land surface and vegetation, but maybe there are others for ice sheet modeling that should be considered. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. So is that two microphones, if you like in the front, there's one here. <laughs> um, I, I heard that there were experiments to look at the impacts of fires on, um, on Greenland, I know that I've been for sea ice, but for the land ice. And what happens when Canada, for example, has major fires? Like, is if uh, there's, I think, an effort to see what the effects of that on, on, would be on Greenland and if that's modeled correctly would be really interesting. Hey, this is Shana online. I can't see what's going on in the room, so I should. Oh, great. <laughs> it's okay, that starts. Um, I, I really love the idea that Tree just put out there about modeling the impact of wildfires. A few other things that, that I was thinking of um, were, so the top point here about using SISM to investigate sea level change across time scales. Yes, absolutely. And I'm also wondering about investigating sea level change across spatial scales by coupling the sea level model that Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we, we, we're losing you. Can you read this last bit? Please. Sorry. 
spatial level change across can I, can spatial it? scales by implementing. Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Uh, now, yes, yes, you you disappeared for a little bit. Oh, I'm so sorry. There's been weird audio things with the virtual format, but I'm wondering about implementing a sea level model where you could check the impact of sea level change across the ocean basin. So as the ice sheets start to lose mass, the spatial fingerprint of the sea level change pattern. Uh, so if, if, if this was a question, um, the, the answer is there's a high interest on our side to actually add some sea level capability, like beyond the simplistic isostatic adjustment that we have. Uh, it's uh, um, there might be different ways of doing it, and this could be a very Herculean effort. But nonetheless, we are going to consider this, and we start talking about it um, with people who actually have a solid earth model that we could incorporate into CSM. Uh, we need to sell this to Encore and to be able to uh, put this in place. But we have high hopes, so uh, hopefully we can do this, and perhaps. With your experience, we could also do some offline coupling back and forth as the way you did it with your um, project. And um, we can definitely talk more about this. Yeah, love to talk more after the workshop. I just wanted to chime in on the wildfire influence because I think the Polar Climate Working Group would also have an interest in that topic um, in terms of the impacts on sea ice and also the terrestrial snowpack. Um, and so there might be a nice, we could maybe think of some joint experiments to run um, that I think would definitely be of interest to the polar group as well. Uh, yeah, I, I want to go back to the sea level uh, idea. So uh, which steps, which steps would you suggest uh, to follow? So, in particular, which levels of bidirectional coupling? So, whether for these sea level fingerprints, would you need any coupling, or you just could need some specific output uh, from the model in some way that is not available now? Um, that's a really good question. I wish I had a better answer. I've been working with coupling um, CESM to PSU 3D, so I haven't been working with CISM, and so I'm less familiar with the CISM setup. But with PSU 3D, I've been doing a two-way coupling between um, CSM and PSU 3D, and then working with Natalia Gomez. Um, so we have like different GIA models under that are being incorporated into her sea level model, and we just basically pass through the bed elevation change, and then she's able to do the coupling using different kinds of GIA models and get the spatial fingerprint. There's there's a little bit more to it than that, but from from the ice sheet end, we're passing um, back basically changes in ice thickness and um, bed elevation change. So if I get it right, so the two applications could be um, the coupling for Antarctica, right? And yes. the other application would be yeah, how, how the global mean sea level rise input translates into the mapping regionally, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the global it, mean will be experienced. Is it yeah. two main lines that you are thinking? Yes. OK, thank you. Thank you. I want to be in Greenland. So specifically for the uh, surface mass balance, our main uh, uh, research gap in the last IPCC report for Greenland is that the GCMs, they don't reproduce the amount of mass loss from Greenland because they don't reproduce the increase in blocking, summer blocking, uh, in the last decade. So the way to go there, I guess, is uh, comparing the cost resolution with high resolution and find where the gaps are and how we can go from one to the other. Um, but uh, so far, what the, 
what uh, we have for Greenland and CSM is high resolution for CSM 1.3, where we don't have an advanced calculation of the MEL. So we can compare atmospheric circulation in one resolution and the other, but the MELT uh, uh, is not very well calculated. Uh, and also, yeah, there is uh, maybe three has some ideas because Adam uh, left. So I, I have the question of how much the variable resolution can help uh, with regard to extremes, or extremes over Greenland because yes, there is the high resolution around Greenland, but not for the full Northern Hemisphere. So I don't know how much of an improvement of blocking uh, is there. So more or less, yeah, the, the, the large question is how to address uh, this research uh, gap about blocking for Greenland with CSM and uh, yeah. whether there is interest uh, about more high resolution or yeah. um, yet stream meanderings, they're not, not only affecting the Greenland blocking, but also uh, heat waves uh, somewhere else, Europe, uh, broads, and so. Um, in, in, in the first item here, so we, we talk a lot about um, modeling aspect within CISM, but also within CSM and within this community right now, we're wondering like, are there any specific modeling needs that we are not addressing right now and that we should put on our radar and that should, we should prioritize in the next thing here, for the near future? What is that? <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad that everybody is happy. That's that's great news. <laughs> Sorry. So we had a number of uh, ideas. We had a number of ideas already about the tipping points, um, extreme uh, that could be covered. Yeah. I yeah. the sound keeps cutting in and out, so apologies if we miss some stuff online. That? Uh, the sound cuts in and out for the folks online, so apologies if we occasionally miss questions from you. Maybe I maybe just I, I leave a question. I don't know if anybody has inputs. So I, I would like to go over um, the topic number three. So it's about diagnostic package uh, needs. Uh, I, I, I want to make it a little bit uh, wider. So um, a little bit uh, wider, not only about the uh, diagnostic package, but also output uh, uh, from the model. Um, are there any inputs at this moment or later about output from the model that is not available for land ice uh, research and uh, that you would like to have and why? All right, so I can talk a little bit about diagnostic package and outputs, changes that are happening or will be happening. Um, 
first of all, for the output stuff, there's uh, a push in CESM to sort of try to bring all of the CESM history output into more compliance with each other. And CISM has some very different ways of handling, say, the time um, dimension than other components. So from CESM standpoint, you guys might be seeing some changes. Well, you should be seeing some changes in that over the next two years before we get to the CMIP, um, CMIP work. And there's some talk about trying to produce CMIP Ized output directly from the model, so you would change an option, and the output would be the same variable names and units as what you would get from as what the CMIP data request is, so that you could get that struct from the model. You don't have to run any scripts like we did last time. The last time we did all this, all we took all the model output history and had to run these scripts that took days, and then more scripts to turn it into a time series and archive. Um, the future is going to be really tricky with the amount of um, data that the model produces getting bigger and bigger every year with higher resolution. So um, we're going to be asked to uh, really consider the output that we produce and in what forms um, before we make it. So I, I imagine that there's going to be some changes from the CMIP side um, from what you see from CISM uh, for sure. And then for the diagnostic packages, this is something that I've been working a little bit on and off on for years. You guys know this. Some of you do have heard me talk about it before. And um, I gave Dave Bailey a rant a few minutes ago because um, right now it's been very difficult. I actually built like the beginnings of a package on top of a technology called Intake ESM that was pretty exciting about two years ago. And then everybody who started building it left NCAR. Um, so there's no like uh, support as far as I know for that. Um, which means that I don't know what direction it takes to try to maintain interoperability with other component packages of the future. And so far, there hasn't been a lot of adoption or work on other component packages for the future. So even like the atmospheric group, um, they're building a replacement diagnostic package for the one that was built in like 1997. Um, and I didn't see a lot of plots from that in the presentations I've seen so far. So it still hasn't been widely adopted as far as I've seen. Um, so I'm not sure from a technology standpoint um, what direction to take a diagnostic package. And maybe that's something that we don't need to worry about everybody else as much. We should just do what we need um, if it's a, a desperate need. But uh, it also sounds like I don't know that but everybody's doing a lot of their own work for diagnostics and making their own plots now. So maybe there isn't as much of a need for diagnost uniform diagnostic packages in the future now that everybody has built uh, supporting some. Okay, Tree's giving me a face. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't know. So yeah, I'd, I'd be curious to think about where this effort should go. One question I have for everybody here, like like um, Kay just said, is that we all do our own things when we do our presentation. And I want to ask you, when you run your simulations and then it comes to like go down to the analysis and cause and relation, what do you look at? And like, is there a way that we could normalize a way to get the output that you would, you know, that is, is your first go and instead of everybody creating their own notebook or whatever, we can just have one that's part of the standardized working group package that everybody can just pick from and just unify this. Maybe not, but uh, I think it's worth asking the question. I think it's absolutely a good idea. I think that, you know, I wish that I'd known about a diagnostic package. I don't know why I didn't, but you know, the. Or I, yeah, I think I did know, but it was like, oh, we're adding different things. So I think it's a great idea, but it's just a, this is a question of effort. Yeah, of course it's a good idea. And we're, you know, every single time a graduate student comes in, it's something like, go ask this person as opposed to their scripts. So that's true, but it's, I think the problem of continuity is, is there an effort behind this kind of systemization if it doesn't exist? If that person doesn't exist, if, you know, the effort and saying it's going to exist for five years, then, you know, yeah. So. It's a question of yes, it's a good idea. Is it actually supported? 
So my, my personal opinion is that we need to be pragmatic. So maybe it is a good idea, but uh, in my opinion, so the first priority could be to create a platform where, where people uh, provide what they have to the community and then, uh, and then we share. And uh, then others, if there is a minimum documentation of that, others can choose what they need and how to build up and then give back again. So I think just creating, uh, creating the space for sharing individual inputs um, could be easy and pragmatically help everyone not to have to rewrite everything from scratch and build up on other people's work. If we, we yeah, anybody online wants to bring uh, anything to the discussion? If not, uh, the session is closed, but the conversation is not. So we keep in contact. And thank you very much for part participating uh, this morning.
expressions. Okay. All right. Yeah, we can move on to uh, the next oh, yeah. stuff. Yeah. I don't want to say, oh, maybe I need to close this. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, well, people online can't hear anyway. Yeah. Oh, they still can't hear? They can now? Uh, I was just curious when you anticipate the first public release with the CAM SEMA will be, and how do you think that will, uh, in terms of support, will that change the user experience? Will they be interfacing with different people, getting different uh, right. block integrated support from NCAR as a whole? So, uh, so thank you. That's that's a great question, and uh, the answer is we don't know. So. Uh, the, the short version is, because of the CMIP 7 timeline, we're aiming for CSM3 fall 2024. Um, obviously, CSM2 slipped a lot, and the question is, well, could we possibly get CAMSEMA done in time for that, to have that be the atmospheric component of CSM3? For, uh, for that great overview. Um, let's see, should I close this? What are you? Just close this window. Let the tech people deal with this so I don't mess anything up. <laughs> So next up, we have uh, Cheryl Craig, who will be talking about the CAM development process. And then... Okay, great. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I'm, I'm Cheryl Craig. I'm going to be talking today about the CAM development process, the software engineering viewpoint, and subtitled Creating Order Without Stifling Scientific Progress. So
us and say, oh, this needs to be done, and so it, it's more efficient to do it that way. Review not started is where PRs uh, reside until we have time to work on it. Uh, we have a, a PR that's new PR since the last meeting, and we always report on what the PR is.
Let's see. It looks like it's coming through. So should we have the podium? All right, gentlemen, it should be good to go. Okay, there to see. Um, next up, we have uh, Eric Pluzik, who will be giving a presentation. Uh, what? There is an echo. Is anybody? Is anybody? Everybody, sound off. Check. Check. Check, 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 one, two, check, one, two. Check one two. Check check one two. No, I can't hear anything. Check one two. Check one two one two. Check one two. Check one two. Check one two. Check one two. Are we hearing it in the Zoom? We still good? All right, hopefully we have that solved now and everyone online can hear too. All right, uh, next we'll have Eric Kluzik speaking on two new components that are being introduced into CESM, Slim and MuseRoute, one simple and one complex. Go ahead. Thanks, Bill. Uh, I wanna recognize some people here. Uh, Marissa Legou is the one that works on SLIM. She's the scientist behind that. Naoki is behind uh, Miseroute. Uh, I've also been working with Sam Levis and Chris Fisher and Mariana Vertenstein on SLIM. Uh, Isla and Scott got us some funding to work on SLIM and Dave and Yaga have got us some funding to work on Miseroute. So, which has been awesome. Uh, so I'm just I'm going to go over CSM components and how they fit Slim and Misera. Uh, then I'm going to go over Slim a little bit about its science and purpose, uh, and then talk about Slim as a software component of C CSM3. Uh, we'll talk about Misera a bit and its science and purpose, and then talk about Misera as a software component of CSM3. So current components in CSM2, uh, you have. Well, notably, you have atmosphere, ocean, sea ice, wave, glacier, and uh, especially you want to pay attention to the land model and the river models. So land model, we have CTSM, and for river, we have Mozart or RTM. So in CSM3, we're going to be introducing SLIM as an alternative uh, to the land model, which is simple land interface model. And then for river, we're gonna introduce Miseroute, which allows complex basins. You know, get into that a little bit later. So SLIM, simple. Uh, SLIM science was developed by Dr. Marissa Legu, and I'm not really gonna say anything about that. Um, and yeah, okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Just that she did it, it you know. It's, it's her stuff, uh, she has papers on it, that sort of thing. Uh, a good question is, is why SLIM? And I, I'm gonna emphasize one thing here, which is that it allows you to change the basic surface properties without it being connected to complex surface physics. Uh, in CTSM, yes, you can change the surface roughness, you can change the albedo, uh, but most likely you're gonna kill the plants there if you do that, or have some kind of complex feedback that doesn't even make sense. 
And so this allows you to do kind of idealized experiments. So what is SLIM? Uh, again, the emphasis is on simple. And mostly I just say, no, we don't have a river model connection. No, we don't do this or no, we don't do that. Um, it's kind of a land model similar to what was used 50 years ago is, was one way to look at it. Uh, SLIM surface data set, uh, CTSM has uh, over 80 different surface characteristics. Um, slim, the SLIM surface data set only has 23. So it's much simpler. Um, you know, and it includes basic things like albedo's roughness, emissivity, et cetera, kind of a simple, a much simpler description. So uh, this is kind of the meat of what I want to talk about with SLIM is uh, taking SLIM from the CTSM code base to something simpler. So SLIM was implemented in CLM uh, 5.0, which is basically 400,000 lines of, of source code. Uh, so it was, it's really implemented in this really complex structure. So it has hundreds of nameless items, hundreds of history fields and complexity of the externals, which are just not needed for SLIM. So what we had to do was the SLIM, SLIM down. Uh, and this is where they cue the, mock, the Rocky music and we, we do a montage of how to SLIM, SLIM down. Do, do some exercise into slim. Uh, and so now what we have is we've been able to slim it down. And so now it has 10, time, 10 fewer lines of code as about 40,000 lines of code. There's just a few nameless options, uh, a few XML items. It's much simpler and much more straightforward to use and to work with for that matter. Uh, and we think this is about the right um, Body mass index is about the right number of code that we want to we want to have in it. So SLIM is a software package. Um, so some of the things that have happened is it's gone from a single developer to multiple. Um, it's gone from a personal repository to ES Comp organization, which is the where the bulk of the CSM repos are. Uh, no formal testing, standard test list. So there was no formal testing. It's gone to standard test list with multiple compilers on both Cheyenne and Izumi, kind of like our other model components. It's gone from no tags to a tag naming convention. And now there's 28 tags so far. Uh, it only used to work with the CSM 2.1 release, and now we have it working as of last night. <laughs> as of last night, I made a tag uh, that's CSM 2.3, uh, beta 10, if you're counting, uh, development version. But that's a nice uh, advancement. Um, it bar before, it borrowed the CLM component name, so it could only run as calling itself CLM. Uh, it was kind of taking the name in vain or something, I don't know. Uh, but uh, now SLIM is recognized as a component in SEAM, and so you can distinguish between SLIM and CLM. Uh, the creation of the SLIM output input files was somewhat ad hoc, and now we have some tools in the repository to help with this, so which is a nice improvement, put everything together. Uh, things that are being worked on with SLIM. So we need to update from CSM 2.3 beta 10 to the very latest CSM 2.3 alpha tag. Um, I, I know we're at alpha 13 or 14, we're around there, right? Something like that. Okay. So it's not much further actually, which should be fine. Uh, and then we're gonna start adding to CSM tags. At first, it'll, it'll only be the MCT version. Uh, we need to finish the development of the new OPSI cap for SLIM. It started, but it isn't finished. Uh, and then we need to update testing to using CI6 and the latest CAM dev instead of older versions of CAM. And we're going to need to evaluate the science to make sure that works in the latest configuration. And it's this, this science development is similar to what it was in development. So, uh, and there's a plan to have SLIM as an optional component 
of CSM going forward with some, some standard testing. So it'll be added to the standard testing for CSM. So CSM tags will include SLIM as part of it. Uh, and also I think we're gonna put it into CAM, the CAM standalone checkout, CAM or CAM SEMA or whatever that is. Uh, I think that'll come in there eventually too as an optional component. Okay. Uh, only works with distributed memory parallelism. It doesn't work with threading, which is probably fine for this simple purpose. So, okay. Next, Miser route. Uh, so the first question is why another river model? In CSM, we already have two river models. We have RTM and we have Mozart. So why bring in a new, new one? Uh, one is we don't have any house ability to create new grids for Mozart. And so part of that, what that means is that if you wanna run paleo simulations, you probably need to use RTM. And that means we need to support both RTM and Mozart. Uh, Mozart can't run on grids, the kind of complex grids that hydrologists use. So uh, in a, as an advancement, we need one that can work on hydrologic response units, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, there's also an advanced ability to model lakes and reservoirs is desired in CSM and CTSM, especially if you're gonna be able to really model river flow, uh, reservoirs make it have a big impact on, on river flow and you, you, you've got to have them in there. Uh, ultimately, Mieser route should allow us to retire both RTM and Mozart because Mieser route can work on the same grids as RTM and Mozart. And so ultimately we'll be able to retire the older codes and just use Mieser route. Uh, so Mieser route works on both regular grid and HRUs. Uh, the science was developed by uh, Naoki Mizukami. Uh, uh, it can run on both standard 2D regular grids like RTM and Mozart in the same grids. Uh, but it can also work on the more complex hydrologic response units. Uh, there's several different scientific options for solving the hydrology. There's ability to model lakes and reservoir has, has been coming in. Um, it runs hybrid, so shared memory and distributed memory parallelism are, are in there. Uh, so it has both OpenMP and MPI. Uh, so catchment data, there's... Uh, four major grids that we use with Mieser route, HDMA, Merit Hydro, uh, it, there were the HDMA Lake, um, and then there's the half degree. Actually, this, this uh, there's also USGS, uh, geospatial uh, framework for just over CONUS. So there's that as well. Uh, and so then we've also set it up, so it works with, uh, one degree, two degree, and half degree resolutions. Um, so one of the things, uh, and well, I guess I'll show this here. So one of the things that's a problem with Mieser route is here's the complexity thing, is that um, in most of our standard grids, you know, I, I mean, a, a standard regular grid that I, I use for CLM, it has each, each grid cell has four points, you know, so you have that square. You have four vertices. So a Mieser route allows for complex base, basin, um, which means you have thousands of grid points, not just a dozen, not just four, but thousands of points. And so one of the problems with that is that for um, online regridding is that when you have a complex grid that has these thousands of vertices, they fit together really carefully and um, ESMF will say, well, there's an overlap of a grid cell by some small amount, or there's a missing point in there. And so ESMF complains and, and also takes a lot of time for it just to read in these, these complex grids. Um, and so we've had to do offline mapping. And so what we do, normally what we do with CSM is the mapping with Nuopsy, is the mapping happens online, you read in your grids, and then it, it figures out the mapping between them. With Mieser route, because they're so much more complex, uh, we have to enter the mapping files to begin with. So we, we do that offline. 
So, and again, just illustrating um, the complexity of these hydrologic response units. Uh, so this shows a little bit about the lake grid and um, you just focus in on here and you see, you know, you look at some random area on the globe and there's tons of lakes. Uh, and so one of the things that Mies are at with the lake model active is allows us to model um, the lakes and we're working on the communication between uh, the land model and the river and Misera as the river model to model those lakes and get the lake depths. So Misera is a component of CSM. So it originally only worked offline and now we can run it as a component of CS CSM. Uh, retra retaining the ability to work standalone outside of CSM. Uh, but we've created a new OPSI cap in the ability to run, build and run in CSM and CTSM. And we're developing a standard test list for Cheyenne and Izumi. Um, we've added history averaging ability, uh, added ability to output for a list of gauges, river gauges, uh, added handling of irrigation, uh, added handling of negative runoff from CTSM and passing it to ocean and added standard CSM file names and the restart and startup options and that, all that sort of CSM infrastructure. Uh, move the repository from NCAR to ESCOMP, kind of the standard uh, organization for CSM components. Um, and with Miser out, threading is always helpful uh, and you can use as many threads as you have available. Um, MPI uh, is a little more complex because uh, how it's going to load balance is going to change with the, the grid. And so um, you should always use as many threads as you can. Um, you can't necessarily optima use op uh, MPI optimally. And so, so it might change us how we think about how to um, you know, load balance Miser out when working with the rest of the model. So that'll be an interesting software challenge. Um, let's see, there we go. So there's some developments to finish. Uh, we need to finalize the test list. Uh, we need to add it as a, an option to CTSM tags. I think technically CTSM tags now have a Miser out version, but it's really old and you can't really use it. Um, we're also going to add it to CSM tags, and again, it'll be an, a regular thing that's in CSM tags as an option. Um, there's some more work that, for sending fields from CTSM to Miser out for the lake, lake models, and uh, we need to start evaluating it when it's coupled to the ocean model and, and see how it compares to Mozart. Uh, and I think that's it that I have. And I think I'm early. Time for a couple questions for Eric. Yeah. Oh. Yes, that is still a question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, so that'll be that'll be a, a future development that'll come in, you know, so yeah, yeah, that's still there. Yep, unfortunately. The visual, visual. Okay. So uh, I see your issues that the visual is very, have the different uh, grid sales. It's based on the basics, and I'm wondering. Right. I, mean, I mean, I guess that if you want to couple this with other components uh, of the CSM, you, you may need to be you may need to deal with the very carefully. So I'm wondering how many grid cells, how many resources are supported with the resources. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I mean that's kind of this chart back here. Let's see if I can get back there. Right here, so uh, so we have what we've set up so far is that we have those 
those four major um, Mesa grids, and we've done mapping to them for you know one degree, two degree, half degree, um, as well as the conus. So, the, so for conus with the NL dust two grid. So we've done you know a few different options. So if you wanted to do something different, um, like an, like we haven't done SE grid or anything complex like that. So. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Right. Cool. All right. Thanks. That's exciting to see these new components coming in. Um, these the, the last talk before the break will be Jim Edwards uh, talking about updates in parallel IO. Okay, I don't need to back here. Can I remove the rest of my title? Okay. Hi everyone. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about the parallel IO library uh, sub subcomponent of CSM, what it is, it's, um, and uh, maybe a little bit about how to use it and some of the new features that it has. How do I move the slide? Just enter? Oh, yeah. Okay. So uh, parallel IO is, is really a communications library. It, it's, it's not technically an IO library. We're just moving data from the compute uh, tasks out to uh, disk. We found um, early on in the development of the parallel net CDF library that trying to write from all the compute tasks when you're using 10,000 or 20,000 compute tasks really doesn't work very well. And so what the parallel IO library does is subset that, um, subset the compute task onto a number of IO tasks and then from those IO tasks write to disk. So you're not going all the way back to a single master task as we were when we were using uh, serial net CDF, um, but we're going to a subset that, that uh, the communications uh, layer can handle. And we have uh, two different types of uh, rearrangement methods possible. The box rearranger is an all to some rearranger that uh, collects the data in, um, can take in, in ordered chunks um, for the IO layer so that um, the communication from the compute task to the IO task is rather complicated, but then the communication from IO task to disk is pretty straightforward. And, um, it, you know, and so that part's fairly fast. With the subset rearranger, which we found we needed with, with larger numbers of compute tasks, mm -hmm. we're going, um, we're, we're just funneling down. So we have certain um, compute tasks write to certain IO tasks and then those write to disk. So the communication from compute task to IO task is, is quite simplified, but then the communication from those IO tasks to the disk is more complicated. Um, and you, you know, so you pay one way or the other. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Okay, that's all for that slide. So what's new? We're we're on uh, the current release is two point six point zero. Um, we've added some features: uh, bit CF integration, um, HCF five filter support, and um, an asynchronous capability. And I'll talk about all those next. Okay, NetCDF integration is a kind of a cool tool if you're. If you have a component model that um, currently is still using serial NetCDF interfaces, you don't have to rewrite all of that NetCDF code and change it to PIO interfaces. You can use the original NetCDF code with the addition of just a few, um, is there a pointer here? Yeah, does that work? Yeah, there it is. Um, the addition of just a few calls um, to implement the, the PIO layer. Um, so one of those is this um, defined IO system, which where'd that pointer go? Oh, there it is. 
which basically sets up the communicators that the, the IO library is gonna use. Um, and then you need to define a decomposition which describes the way the data is, what, and you're so confusing me. Just this point. The point up there? Oh, it won't work. but it won't work on nine. I'm good here, I think. Um, so yeah, the, the um, defined decomposition describes how the data is on the compute task versus how it is on disk. Um, and then the rest of these calls are, you know, the original NetCEF calls that you don't need to change at all until you get down to where you actually want to write data. And then there is a new interface um, to write the data that incorporates the uh, PIO specific information. Um, and then, you know, when you're done, you need to clean up some stuff that you created when you, when you uh, started. So it makes it very easy to convert a NetCDF serial application to use PIO. Um, I don't know that anyone is using this yet, but I, I hope somebody will give it a try and let me know if there's any problems with it. HDF5 and data compression support is a new feature in 2.6.0. Um, it's only available with the NetCDF 4 HDF5 format, which is kind of a problem because HDF5 is not exactly a really good parallel um, uh, library. It, it's, I wish the performance is there, it's just not quite there. Um, but HDF5 does have these filters. You can, you can uh, stack filters on one another. Um, there's several predefined filters available. Um, and it depends on how your NetCDF library and HDF5 library were built, but Z standard, uh, BZIP2 and deflate are all um, lossless compression techniques. Um, the quantized techniques are, are lossy compression. And what you can do is, is uh, combine the quantized with one of the other uh, lossless techniques to do some pretty good um, compression algorithms. And this is just uh, some of the new calls that are in uh, PIO to support that. Um, asynchronous IO is, is now functionally implemented in CSM and, and being tested. Unfortunately, uh, the performance isn't there yet. Um, we could use some, some, uh, uh, some more support to uh, get, get performance into this asynchronous IO layer. Um, but um, but we are testing it in the CSM framework to, to make sure that it continues to work. And um, uh, these two examples show uh, uh, one. So here you're using one IO task per node. This is on Duratio, so you have 128 CPUs per node. You're using one of those for IO. It's asynchronous from the rest of the model. It uses, the model's using 127, IO is using one. And then, um, and then another example, here we're using um, four tasks, four IO tasks on a node um, and separating that node completely from the rest of the model. And I'll explain why I think that's a really interesting case in the next slide, I think. No, I'm not gonna explain it yet. I'll get to it, I hope. Anyway. Um, so one thing about the data compression is that we don't need to change the component models in order to add data compression. Um, my plan is hopefully to implement a configuration file that can uh, pattern match on file names. So you give it a file name uh, pattern that it's gonna match and then the variables in that file that you want to compress, tell it how you wanna compress them. And it can do all that Without, inter without having to change the component model that it's, that it's using. Um, I hope maybe we can implement that in the coming year. Um, and then we did a, uh, we participated in a hackathon. Um, I did along with uh, Ben Kirk of, of Sizzle and, and Brian Dobbins. And uh, we looked at some new technology. Um, there's something called GPU Direct IO that's currently available on Casper. It will be available on Duratio after 
or it's potentially available on Duratio after the current GPS file systems have retired, GPFS file systems have retired, which I think is around December. Um, those file systems are incompatible with this feature, so they can't turn it on yet. But the point is that you could write directly to disk from the GPU without having to go back through CPU and memory. Um, so in this hackathon, we did a kind of a proof of concept where um, we ran HDF5 and PIO on the um, GPU nodes and you know, wrote directly to this from there. Um, this gives you the, the potential to add data compression on GPU nodes, which, hey, you know what? GPUs are really good at data compression. Why not? Okay, so, so the idea is to run the climate model on CPU nodes and then have um, the IO interface running on a GPU node and using the GPUs to write, write to disk. And uh, hopefully we'll get some more time to, uh, to work on that and get it going under ratio. We do have some outstanding issues. Um, currently the, uh, the data compression methods used on the GPU, even though it's using the same technique, for example, Z standard, as the CPU code, it's, it's encoding it in a slightly different way. And so they're not compatible with CPU. So if you compress something on the GPU and then you wanna use it on a CPU machine, well, you're stuck. So that's something we need to, we need to resolve before we can really use this method. The, the, the data compression techniques need to work regardless. Uh, you know, they need to be independent of what kind of machine you're, you're compressing on or decompressing on in order for that data to be useful to, to our community, I think. Um, and then HD, the HDF5 filter methods tend to, um, and, and again, this is just an implementation issue, I think they, they tend to move things back to CPU for certain operations that they could be doing on the GPU. And so you get a lot of, of communication going back and forth, which really slows things down. And then um, Parallel IO is, is, you know, it's available on GitHub. There's the, the site. It's in um, an NCAR repository. It's also a uh, package now in SPAC and Conda Forge and Easy Build if you've used any of those. Um, I've, I've been learning SPAC and using it. Um, it's going to be a, a component on uh, Gust and Duratio, and I, I really like it. I, have discovered a new thing. <laughs> okay, I, I'm gonna switch gears now and talk about uh, something else that I, I think Eric will appreciate. And that's um, a, new, uh, a new decomposition method for CESM that we call ESMF aware threading. Um, so currently when you're running CESM and you want to run threads, if you have multiple, multiple components that are concurrent on uh, a task, you have to thread all those components the same way. So if, you're, if your coupler and atmosphere are, are both concurrent on the task, then the, the coupler has to run three threads, even though there's no threading in the coupler, you know, so you're just kind of wasting uh, compute resources there. Um, and this thing at the bottom, Oh, okay. So, but so what you can do with ESMF aware threading, um, in that case, ESMF is going to use all of the um, CPUs on a node in an MPI manner. So, for example, on Duratio, uh, ESMF would use all 128 slots. And then you can individually select the number of tasks and threads for each component under that. So you can run four threads in the atmosphere, but only one thread in the um, land model with four times as many tasks, and, th and that now works. Um, so that's a great solution for the MISA route that needs a lot of threads, right? So you're, you're not stuck with having everything have to have a lot of threads for MISA route to work. Um, and, but you got to be aware that, that it changes the definition of root PE from what we're currently doing to something which is based on the total number of tasks on, on a node. 
always. So it it messes with your head when you try to do this. <laughs> um, and, and the other thing is that it's already extremely complex to balance, to load balance a fully coupled CSM model. This just adds more complexity. So, um, sorry, it's not gonna make it any easier. Um, so, you know, here's a, a little picture example where uh, we wanted to run three threads in the atmosphere. Well, that requires us to run three threads in land and the, the runoff model and the ice as well. And, and in fact, on Doratio, I learned that it re also requires us to run three threads in the ocean, even though the ocean is completely um, on separate processors from the rest of it. And that's, that's actually a bug that I think we can fix in Seam. But, um, but I was playing around with this last week and I learned it, learned that. And um, so, but with ESMF aware threading, you can just, you know, you multiply the number of tasks in the coupler by three and use, you know, three threads in the atmosphere and then multiply these guys by three and, you know, MPI task and, and that works now. So, so that's a nice thing. And hey, that's all I have. So there, there was something I wanted to mention back here. It was about... Do you remember what it was about? Oh gosh, I'm sorry, I can't remember. Anyway, I'm done. Thank you. Any questions? Oh. Yeah, I was just okay. um, so my experience is that as PIO has gotten more complex, um, the uh, having it working on unsupported machines has been uh, more and more difficult. It uh, has had like uh, like sub versions of one big line that kind of thing. Um, are there plans for you guys to go to like two teams or um, have well publicized for this sort of thing? Um, yeah, we could try to do that. <laughs> that's, a, you know, that's a good idea. We should do it. But um, yeah, I'm sorry there's not more there now. Hey, Mark. I have another question. Okay. From the uh, ESMF side, um, are there any plans to do like a uh, like a look at the core bindings? Like, do you need different core to switch dynamically? Um, because the core binding happens at the ESMF layer, it's all, um, it, it seems to be okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. That's great to see these exciting new developments. Um, so we'll break for half an hour, return at 3.30 um, for our second half of the session.
the PowerPoint. It's a PDF. You should be able to dance it now, though. All right, so uh, we're going to be gathering tonight for dinner after the wrap up session that's going to be at 630 at the Rayback Collective here in North Boulder, and I hope uh, many of you can join us there. So without further ado, uh, we're going to start with a talk by Elena Romashkova. So please come up. And uh, are you going to load her, her talk? Okay. Before you go, Lynn, I'm just yeah. going to put the screen. Sounds good. I'm going to start sharing. Um, should I just like balance my laptop on top of there? or What works best for you? I don't know. I'd like probably better than carrying it. Um, Do you want to still be able to control it, I assume, right? Yes. Um, I just started sharing the screen. Um, let's start. <laughs> I can just like push that back, or no, because like, it's... Um, it's not live right now, so if you want, go ahead. I'll mess with it later. Yeah. All right, am I good to go? Cool. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Elena. I'm an associate scientist in the oceanography section, and I've been working on developing a new, a new workflow for CSM diagnostics, primarily built on Jupyter Notebooks. So I'll just be kind of going over a general overview of that and some talk about what development I'm currently working on. And I want to give a shout out to many of my collaborators in the ocean section, Matt Long, who first came up with this idea, Deepak, who I've been working with a lot, as well as Gustavo, who works a lot on diagnostics, and uh, Keith, who's been working on a lot of the cataloging work associated with this. All right. Um, so first, to introduce the goals of this new workflow, um, there's a couple of sort of guiding principles that I've been working on. First, I want it to be notebook-based um, for easy sharing and annotating. Um, I see most of you have probably worked with Jupyter Notebooks, but they allow you to have a combination of code cells, plots, and uh, annotation text in Markdown. So it makes it easier to annotate things that you might be looking at. We also wanted to support uh, scripts like Python scripts that you might be used to running for diagnostics so that things are more easily back compatible. We want the diagnostics framework to be flexible so that you can either run a configuration out of the box or customize it as you want to your own needs. Um, it doesn't even actually have to be on CSM output. If you want to use the framework for any kind of analysis, it works for that too. But you can also download one config file and run an out of the box sort of framework for, for example, the ocean model, land model, et cetera. Um, we want it to be catalog friendly for simpler data access. Catalog is sort of abstract away having to deal with hard coded paths that might get moved around. Um, and so that makes it easier to run things out of the box. And finally, we want the framework to be able to run on different types of computational resources. So not just on NCAR machines, but also for example, locally or on other machines that people might be using for working with CSM. So as an intro, uh, this is the working title for the diagnostics package. It stands for Notebook-Based Super Customizable Infrastructure for Diagnostics. And it's currently live on GitHub. I'll give the link at the end so you can start playing around with it if you want. For a slightly more in-depth overview of what this looks like, the inputs to the workflow include um, parameters, which can include anything that you're putting into the diagnostics to control how they're working. For example, what date range you wanna run a calculation on, what latitude you wanna calculate something at, a variable you might, you're plotting, if it's flexible enough for that. And if you want to include paths to specific things that might not be in catalogs, that can be included as well. Really anything that can be put in as string, flow, dictionary, et cetera. The other input is a data catalog, which is um, just a data structure that includes paths to things like where your case group lives and so on. Those get passed into a set of primarily Jupyter notebooks. I just have a couple different examples of what kind of diagnostics you might be run, you might want to run, and those all, of, all get batch executed by a tool called Papermill that I'll talk about more later. The final step of the process is taking those Jupyter notebooks and turning them into a Jupyter book which if it's not something you've worked with before is a way of rendering Jupyter notebooks as HTML. 
that you can share with other people, or you can also host it online as a website so that people can easily look through your results and whatever annotations you might want to add to it. So diving into the technical details a little bit more, this is the tool stack that I'm working with for this pipeline. You definitely don't, know, don't have to know what all of these are, but in case some of them ring a bell, I'm using Papermill as the tool that um, inserts parameters and automatically executes the notebooks so that you don't have to go in and run them cell by cell. Jinja is being used for parameterizing markdown cells in the notebooks. Um, so what that does is if you want to change the title of a notebook with a parameter that you're passing in, for example, in the annotation text, you can do that. Dask is being used for parallelizing things. Intake ESM is being used for parsing catalogs. ESM Catalog Utils is a new tool that Keith Lindsay is working on for catalog creation. And JupyterBook, which I mentioned before, is being used for turning Jupyter Notebooks into that publishable, shareable HTML that I mentioned before. So diving another down another level, uh, this is sort of more the how the actual workflow looks if you're working with it. Everything is run off of a single config YAML file. The things that you put in there are where your data catalog lives, the path to the template notebooks that you're working with. So basically all of the, all of the code that hasn't been parameterized and run yet. Any global parameters that you wanna work with. So if you wanna compare multiple notebooks to the same observation set, for example, any notebook specific parameters, like I mentioned before, a date range, latitude, that sort of thing, and some config for the Jupyter book, um, basically the table of contents if you've worked with Jupyter book before. The actual command that you run is nbsquid-run on that config.yaml file. And what that does is it passes the parameters that you want to the notebooks and executes them all through paper mill. That gives you a set of executed notebooks with the parameters that you want. Following that, if you want to create a Jupyter book, which you don't have to, um, but if you do want to, you can run nbsquid-build config.yaml. And that's basically a wrapper on Jupyter Books internal build tools. And that will create all the notebooks that'll take all the notebooks that you had in that Jupyter table of con Jupyter book table of contents and make them into a nice shareable Jupyter book. So um, without further ado, so you can sort of see what this looks like, I'll jump into a quick demo. Um, so this is a case that I've been working on uh, playing around with MOM6 diagnostics. Um, it's pretty bare bones, um, but it serves to show how the tool works overall. I executed stuff ahead of time because I wasn't sure if things would hold up with technical difficulties. Um, but the command that I ran first was the one that I mentioned, nbsquid run config.yaml that executed the two notebooks that I'm running that you'll see momentarily. I then ran the builds command and that created the Jupyter book. So jumping into the Jupyter book, which is the final result. Um, this is just living in my Jupyter hub, but it can also be posted in other locations. So this is just the quick um, home notebook that I have. I parameterized this cell down here. And this is the actual diagnostic notebook that I'm working with. So what this notebook is doing is calculating some differences between model results and observations for temperature and salinity at different depths. Uh, what you guys need to know is what's happening here is these parameters that I've put in, which have some paths to observations, as well as some paths to where um, the CSM case lives, along with some other test stuff, that's getting passed in by paper mill. Uh, it's managing computational resources, like I mentioned, and then doing the standard stuff that you would expect from some diagnostics. So creating a bunch of plot here of temperature differences and down here of salinity differences. So also shout out to Gustavo for creating this notebook in the first place. Um, but that's getting run automatically. And in more complicated cases, you'd have lots and lots of different notebooks here, potentially having um, like one notebook run with different types of parameter sets. And that whole thing is shareable with somebody else. So you can be like, hey, I just did this run. Here's the results of it. I've also added some annotations to show what's going on. So jumping back to the presentation. These are my backup slides for the demo in case that didn't work. Um, but yeah, some other features of the package that I didn't go into is in as much detail. Um, I think I did mention that one, but you can run it out of the box with a pre-made config or customize it as much as you want. You can even customize it to the point of not running it on CSM diagnostics. It could be useful for any sort of analysis workflow that you're doing. 
You can run just one template notebook on different sets of parameters. So if you want to run something at like 60 degrees latitude or 30 degrees latitude, you could run that multiple times in one run. You can run notebooks in different, different environments. So if you have specific packages that you've made that may, might not be compatible with each other, you can do that automatically. And you can also cache intermediate results. So if you have some time-consuming calculations that you don't want to be running multiple times as you're doing development, um, this can save intermediate data products, know when things have been changed, and automatically pass those in later. All right. So moving on to what I'm currently working on and also open questions. Uh, so that's kind of the discussion portion of this. So the main thing that I'm currently working on is experimenting with bringing MOM6 diagnostics into this pipeline. Uh, for comparison, uh, this is what the current workflow for diagnostics for MOM6 looks like. The diagnostic functions all live in a GitHub repo called MOM6 tools. That is That creates a series of Python scripts that get configured by a different YAML file and get submitted by a bash script through QSub. And that creates output net CDF files that can then be displayed through notebooks in a different repo called MOM6 Solutions. So the goal is to take that pipeline and use the elements of it um, within my workflow instead to make um, this sort of more, more flexible, easily usable by different people workflow. So I'm very much in the middle of playing with that along with uh, Gustavo's help. And I also have a whole lot of software development that I'm still working on. The two current big steps are executing diagnostics in parallel relative to each other. So while they're parallelized within the actual, within the actual diagnostic, I want to be able to run different ones that don't, be, don't depend on each other at the same time through this method. And I'm also working on implementing running diagnostics that are not yet Jupyter Notebooks. So just standard.py files that you might already be used to working with. Um, part of the, one of the questions, one of the questions that sort of envelops that is how I'm managing computational resources and that affects how, um, notebooks are being run in parallel. So currently this is sort of diving into the weeds. So you definitely don't have to, don't have to understand all of it. Um, but the way that I'm currently managing this is I first create a global DAST cluster, uh, currently just only works on Casper. I wait for at least a one worker to appear and I pass that worker's schedule address to each notebook. Each notebook creates a client and attaches it to that global cluster. And with that, each notebook runs in serial relative to each other. Some of these diagnostics take quite a while to run. And so I wanna be able to run them at the same time and also not be dependent on running it on Casper. I want this tool to run both locally and on non NCAR machines. So I've been thinking about potentially rep leveraging existing packages for um, this sort of data pipeline work. One that I've been looking at is Plumber, which works to parallelize notebooks, also runs Python scripts, and creates a more complicated task graph to pass data more flexibly between diagnostics. So if you have different things that depend on each other, this can do a better job of, um, of managing that and making sure things run in the right order. So this is sort of the um, open questions part. If anybody has worked with this tool or has other suggestions for things that can do this before, I would love to hear about it because I'm very much trying to balance doing my own development and bringing in tools that can do part of what I want. Also thinking about joining efforts with other CSM diagnostics. I've met with multiple people in the audience to figure out what is going on around the organization with diagnostics. There's currently a number of scattered efforts and I wanna make sure that um, we're sort of unifying those a little bit more so that we have um, good, well-developed tools that work for everybody. And so that's another current avenue of work. And yeah, uh, that brings me to the end of the talk. So these are some links that you can reference. This has um, the package, which you can already play with, uh, some currently bare bones, but working on making it better documentation, some usage examples, and my email if you'd like to collaborate on this. Um, and I want to open it up to any sort of discussion, input, et cetera, since this is very much in development right now. Okay, thank you. Questions? Collaborations? Yes.
that online session platform. Okay. Are any of these tools oh, oh. already out available to people? Yes. So um, things are available on GitHub, and the main README has instructions for how to install it off of PIP. The examples repo has like a tutorial sort of example that you can start running. And I'm working on creating lots more content so that people can take it and run with it. So okay. yes. Now there's another question. Yes. So uh, in our previous uh, packages, so uh, diagnostics. Yeah. Uh, they weren't really like uh, very generic. For instance, we couldn't use them for regional models or we couldn't use them for really high resolution models. Yeah. Do you uh, uh, account for that? That these, that these uh, packages, can we use these for different types of grids, different types of you know, workloads or? Yeah, definitely. So there's actually nothing in this package that's even like CSM specific. Mm -hmm. It's really just like some infrastructure for running notebooks with some tools that help you work with like intermediate data products and so on. So as long as you have tools to work with like different grids and stuff like that, that you can pull in from other packages, there is nothing at all that limits it from working on that. So the idea is for it to be as flexible as possible. Yeah. Right. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to move on to the remote talk. So probably uh, need some help here. And uh, we're going to have uh, Jill Zhang talking to us about post-processing workflows and tools for DOEs in BSM. Hi. Oh, hello. Hi, we can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, let me... you All right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation for the talk. And my name is Jill Chen Zhu Zhang. I'm at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and I have been developing analysis tools and uh, data management tools for ESRSM project. And uh, I listed um, my ESRSM collaborator here and they are core developers for the post-processing tools that I'm going to present. A little bit of instruction or uh, introduction. E3SM, it stands for the Energy Exascale Earth System Model. So it focuses on DOE missions and DOE leader leadership computing facilities. The E3SM project and CSM ha has tight a connection from the beginning. The version one of the model was branched off from CSM uh, 1.0, and the atmosphere model was branched off from CAM5 and the land from uh, CLM 4.5. And we introduced a new components, including the Mozart River model and the NPAS framework for ocean, sea ice, and land ice. And we have an uh, infrastructure group that supports the tools to run ESRSM and to post-process and analyze, analyze the data. Today, I'm only going to focus on the post-processing part. So yeah, when the simulation is ready, uh, it takes steps to get the data ready for scientific discovery. Post-processing takes care of data reformation and distribution to facilitate data interpretation uh, for yeah the post processing can cover a range of broader a broad a broader range of activities so for co for core post processing tasks uh, we get time series net cdf files for instance so same format of per variable files on regular let long grid and the climatology net cdf files and standard diagnostics results. To larger contexts, data archive and distribution can be part of the post-processing. Next, I'm just going to um, briefly talk about the current ESRSM post-processing workflows. So right now we have two uh, workflows. The first one is the analysis workflow. For, um, so it is applied for every simulations what it does is to stage the data to the format that the diagnostics package can take 
and run the diagnostics package for model evaluation. And the second uh, workflow it focuses on data management. From short-term archive, we have a Zstash tool for long-term archive. And then from long-term archive, we have a data publication workflow to make the data available for the public. Uh, I will first talk about the analysis workflow. Uh, we have several major tools included in our standard analysis workflow, uh, including NCO, which is for regrading, climatology generation, time series extraction. It supports all ESRO-SM components. And we have the ESRO-SM DIAX, which is a Python package for atmosphere evaluation and has limited support for land and the river analysis. I want to mention that the ESRO-SM DIAX package is modeled after the AMWG diagnostics package. Uh, we have the key components from AMWG package implemented and extending on that, we are adding more post-process uh, oriented diagnostics packages, diagnostics. And the MPAS analysis is the Python package for ocean and sea ice evaluation. And then we also have an ESRO-SM unified environment. That, that is a kind of package for distributing all the above tools to support analysis across DOE computing platforms. Uh, lastly, we have a new tool called CP. It is a post-processing tool to automate these commonly uh, performed analysis. And I also want to point out that there are more tools we are used in ESRO-SM evaluation. And the, I listed the tools that are already used and that we plan to use in the future for more comprehensive model evaluation. A little bit more on ZP. The goal of ZP is to speed up the post-processing by automating commonly uh, performed analysis tasks. So it builds around tasks running by NCO and multiple diagnostics tools. It also generates global mean time series and overall plot for time series. This is a, a framework that really can simplify the tool uses. So each individual diagnostics package have a little bit learning curve. So they have different methods for configuration and different input data requirement. So ZP is a tool to facilitate that. And especially for long simulations, ZP can run the same tasks for multiple uh, year range in parallel. What the user needs to provide is just a, a single configuration file. And the ZP can parse the configuration file, handle the dependencies among the tasks, and generate sub submit batch jobs for execution by Slurm. So overall, the ZP, uh, the, the ZP tool uh, can really uh, help the new users to get a hands-on for the whole analysis system. Then I want, want to talk about the ESRO-SM data management tools. Um, in the project, um, all pro production simulations are required to be archived uh, uniformly on NERSC HPSS. And we, we also support publication of native files and a subset of M uh, CMA formatted files to ESGF. Some major tools I want to mention here is the Zstash tool for long-term archiving and the ESRSM to CMIP script for reformatting native ESRSM output to CMIP standard. And we have a data state machine to automate all of these uh, data publication related tasks. A, li a little bit um, more on Zstash. So the ESRSM simulations are all archived uniformly uh, with Zstash. The reason we have this tool is that the tape system doesn't like um, too many, too small files, and it lacks all of the data consistency check mechanism. 
So we created this tool to facilitate archiving. Um, this tool has several features, include, including that it creates st standard TAR files um, before transfer to HPSS, and it computes checksums on the fly for data consistency check. And the metadata are stored in the SQLite 3 index database for faster retrieval. And the parallel extraction and the verification are enabled for performance. Uh, recently, we added a support to enable automated global bus transfer to move archive files to other systems. On the bottom, um, it shows the performance comparison between Zstash and, and the two manually archiving or extraction uh, files with HSI, TAR, or checksum tools. So what do we do with all these Zstash archive? Next, I want to introduce the ESRSM data publication workflow. Um, the, the simulation team will notify us when a simulation is done and after they are archived on HPSS. And then we start the whole data publication process. We use Globus to transfer the archive from HPSS to a local ESRSM archive. And we do archive mapping to only collect paths for targeted files. And all the processes below are automated. They include dataset extraction, dataset validation, der derivative generation, and the dataset publication to ESGF. And finally, the verification for the publication. And I want to talk about what we learn uh, in this uh, using this system to handling large size data. So far, we have published about two, ter two petabytes of data to ESGF. And uh, what uh, we find to be useful is firstly to have the data set validation step. So it's needs to be done upfront to ensure a clean native data to start with. So this process helps us to uncover missing files so that we can uh, re-request to, uh, to recover the data if possible. And it helps to uncover the overlapping files and the mismatching time indexes. This is open, often happen with non-default restart and uh, to maintain a, a temporary warehouse or called staging area is useful. This area is having a unified tree breakout structure so that we can rectify the variously formatted data sets. For instance, some simulations are not short-term archived and some simulations have different meaning for each type uh, number or frequency. And this area is helpful to host the repaired data sets when needed. And uh, it is our temporary place uh, to hold native and derived data until publication is authorized. Finally, uh, what is critical is to maintain a data set status files. They are used to track status of data flow in each stage per data set. I provide an example here, uh, which is an entry, oops, sorry, which is an entry in the uh, dataset status file. So it includes the timestamp, the name of the post-processing step and the status. So it has been really helpful. For instance, right now we are asked to uh, process V1 and V2 large ensemble at the same time. And uh, these files really help us to uh, do forensic study if anything goes wrong, and it is straightforward to generate an assessment uh, file with based on these status files. And I want to highlight some future works that we'd like to have. Um, if you can, uh, if you already noticed that our workflows are still not end to end. So the data publication and analysis workflows can be consolidated beta better to avoid redundancy. And we did, we want 
to implement auto generation of simulation documentation page, which is currently done manually by the developers. And we are facing more larger size data set challenge. In the science group, there are efforts going on to reduce variables from production runs, but this is a slow going effort and needs a lot of iterations between the science groups. Even with a confined variable list for the upcoming three kilometer ultra high resolution runs, we are ex expecting 100 terabyte of output per simulated year. So we will like to explore more data, data compre compression mechanisms. And we are also working on enhance the performance for individual tools. So at the end, I want to list all the post-processing tools here. And um, I think uh, some, most of these tools are common purpose tools, which can be shared by different modeling centers. And the um, CSM and ISRSM are already working on the case control system together and on some diagnostics package development. So we will... I'm happy to see more of the collaborations. And I also want to uh, point out most of our tools are written in Python and we support open development on GitHub. So please um, leave us a, a line on GitHub and any inquiries and the collaborations are more than welcome. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. Uh, any questions, comments? Do you, do you know of any people already, any groups already using your tools? You mentioned a couple of collaborations with the CSM community, right? Seam and the Ensemble tools. How, how's that going? Oh, right. Yeah, I think then we are talking uh, about this post-processing with Nam, and it seems like he's she's already using the Zstash tools, but uh, I'm hoping, yeah, more people in the CSM community can maybe try to look at the tools and start to use them. Yeah, she's raising her hand here saying, yes, shaking her head. <laughs> All right, other questions? Okay, if not, uh, no. We're going to thank you very much. We're going to go to the next talk, which will be by Tracy Hurtnecki of NCAR, and she'll talk to us about establishing community requirements for hierarchical system development for Earth system models. All right, hi, thank you. Um, and um, yeah, I just want to acknowledge all of the team members that have been part of this project so far for establishing these community requirements for hierarchical system development. Um, this has mainly been, um, our purpose has been for the unified forecast system, which is the kind of the next generation, you know, operational, you know, re operational and research, research forecast system, um, but it can be applied to other, um, uh, 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 Earth system models as well. So most of you are probably familiar with hierarchical system development. So HSD is an efficient pathway for model development, um, enabling uh, the community with um, multiple uh, entry points for research efforts, uh, spanning simple to complex models. So in the diagram here on the right, um, it gives a high level understanding of the HSD testing of uh, various model components. Um, with the, the top being you know, a more simplified model um, and then going down and becoming more complex as you go down to the bottom where you see the more fully coupled model. And so within each of the mo these uh, uh, model hierarchies, you can 
um, have multiple configurations available and um, um, entry points for those process level assessments. And of course, you know, with these more simplified models, um, you have a you gain a better understanding of the, the physical processes. And as you uh, go down the, the line to the fully coupled model, you, uh, it, those that understanding of the physical processes can you know become muddled and um, harder to understand. And then the opposite can be said for the you know the full system. So um, the uh, so there, there's many unique perspectives of HSD, and those can be defined by model complexity, model configurations, or even principles of large scale circulation. Um, and so this is a, a really hot topic that's you know been um, had, had workshops on it, multiple publications, and so on and so forth. And it serves an, as an end-to-end -end system. So providing a configurable workflow um, that can handle you know, everything from pre-processing, running the model to post-processing, um, and also includes an infrastructure for software testing as well. So why do we need uh, HSD? So the, the systematic representation of model hierarchies connects our understanding from idealized models to more comprehensive models. And it provides the research community with simpler versions of a more complex system that are easier to understand and work with generally. Um, it uh, ultimately enables research to operations and vice versa, um, that connection between the research and operations by providing testing pathways for innovations and updates from the research community. So the schematic on the right um, should, gives an overview of the HSD R2O 2 cycle. So you have the model system, and, and then from that, you would choose an application medium range or uh, uh, seasonal to sub-seasonal, and then do an assessment of that application. And from that assessment, you would do these uh, uh, fine processes and phenomena that are of relevance or interest to you, and then selecting suitable cases that you can then perform detailed studies using these HSD tools and uh, and that may include, you know, multiple configurations at various uh, hierarchical uh, uh, across uh, hierarchical models, and then you would then um, relay the the uh, those findings to the developers, who can then design system improvements and assess the impacts across all of the applications. And so that can then be fed back. These model improvements can be fed back to those that are performing these detailed studies. And so it could be an iterative process back and forth until it is um, established into the model system. So um, the HSD can also be an efficient use of compute resources. So, um, you know, always, you know, running the, you know, fully coupled comprehensive model, you would use the, you know, the most elegant or simple model that makes sense for your specific um, process uh, or, or uh, physical process level uh, 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 investigation. So this is just a quick example kind of to illustrate the R2O um, with a, a real case study. So, uh, this was part of the UFS R2O project. And so the upper left um, um, image shows uh, the mean um, total area cloud fraction. This was run over um, a year long um, retrospective. So using the, the, global, the global model uh, perspective GFS V16, which is now in operations now, um, looking at the assessment revealed the um, underestimation in marine stratocumulus off of the west coast of the continents. And so those are in the bullseyes there um, in the circles. And so then selecting a suitable case study to look more at the process level, um, physical processes um, that, that might be um, uh, resulting in those negative biases. So we chose the magic um, case study um, for this. And for this um, campaign, there was a ship traversing between Hawaii or for, from LA to Hawaii um, to observe and characterize these uh, stratocumulus cloud regimes. Um, and so this is a prime case to, to be able to really dig deep into the physical processes. And, and, um, and so we used the uh, com common community physics package single column model um, to look at or to dive into the physical processes um, uh, of these marine stratocumulus clouds. And so the, the, the left or the right panels show uh, the model performance from the single column model for various um, physics suites that were, that are um, being in, uh, intended for, you know, uh, uh, operational use, as well as looking at across scales um, in both the horizontal and the vertical. 
Um, and so, so basically these, these results were then fed back to the developers. Um, and so this kind of um, it demonstrates the, the R2O relationship here. And, and so, um, yeah. So, um, so what we're currently working on is, so the DTC, which is the Devel Developmental Testbed um, Center, um, which was um, currently um, supporting EPIC, which is the Environmental Prediction Innovation Center. It's uh, the center that's being stood up by NOAA to improve operational weather and climate forecast systems. Um, so we're in, in collaboration with EPIC to develop um, these HSD capabilities. So the DTC is charged with creating a white paper that documents the long-term vision for UFS and HSD um, and the plan for its progressive um, implementation. So we're collaborating closely, closely with the EPIC team to establish these community requirements for HSD. Um, and again, again, this is really for the, the, UFS, the UFS um, with respect to the collaboration with EPIC, but these results can also be used by other Earth, Earth system modeling groups as well. So we began by soliciting impact from soliciting input from the community via broadly distributed survey. So some of you may have received this uh, survey and also fill it out. Um, and so we're also providing the building blocks and the vision for the HSD framework for EPIC to stand up and support to the UFS community. And the, the overall goal is really to integrate the HSD capabilities together in a holistic way to support and accelerate the R2 processes and also to identify additional developmental capabilities for HSD. So as I mentioned in the, the uh, beginning slides is, you know, the HSD is really spanning from these simplified models to these more comprehensive models. And one quote that kind of stood out um, from our team members was that the term hierarchy is a misnomer and it becomes clear that if a strict hierarchical ordering is sought, it must exist along multiple axes simultaneously. So our team proposed four um, HSD axes for the UFS, and those include the simulation realism, hierarchy of scales, sample size, and um, mechanism and interaction denial capabilities. So for simulation realizing realism, uh, providing the capabilities to run these more simplified and idealized simulations all the way through to the fully coupled model, hierarchy of scales, um, uh, providing the capabilities to look at, you know, course defined grids or global to regional domains, and also including the capability for nested models or variable resolution models. For sample size, providing capabilities to run just a single case study um, to a month or a seasonal case study um, out to a year and beyond. Um, for mechanism and interaction denial, um, it is what it is. So within your modeling system, you're um, denying some interaction or mechanism within the model. For example, the single column model denies interactions with the dynamics. So you're pro providing those you know, large scale or advective forcings to the model. Piggybacking, uh, in a nutshell, it um, provides uh, a disconnect between the, uh, the dynamics and, and, and the physics uh, feedback loops. Uh, the community data model, environmental predictive systems, um, or CDEPs, um, uh, effectively um, removes feedbacks uh, between the, the coupled model system by replacing one of the component models with uh, a CAN set of data model, um, and so on and so forth. So I won't go over all of these, but you get the idea of what that is. Um, so all of the hierarchies um, within these um, HSD axes really. Um, facilitate the, the testing capabilities um, for um, uh, new innovations and um, um, updates on in model in models. So, um, and it's been a, a, a hot topic that I've um, observed, um, talked about uh, a lot throughout the, the CESM workshop as well. So on to the community engagement survey, the purpose was to gather insights and feedback from the broader community to help shape the future direction of HSD. So the results are gonna be incorporated into a white paper to define the current state, future needs and the recommendations for HSD. 
And so there was a total of 55 participants from a broad spectrum of disciplines um, and organizations. So the pie chart here just shows kind of the, the that the research and research scientists and postdocs took a big chunk of this. Um, also had professors, professors and faculty members from various universities, software engineers, managers, and then developers, and or a combination of all these disciplines. We also um, queried uh, the participants on their usage of HSD, and actually under 50% use HSD in some aspect of their work. 3.6% were unsure if they used HSD, so maybe they just don't understand um, uh, the, 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 what HSD is, and 54.5% uh, do not use HSD capabilities, and that could be for a number of reasons. Um, one of them could be that the, the specific application they're using does not yet support um, higher model hierarchies and so on and so forth. So just making sure that we are providing those capabilities to the community is important. We also did questions that pertain to the necess necessity to develop HSD capabilities, such as uh, nesting and idealized simulations. And that'll be um, looked at in more depth on the next slide. We also queried the community on perceived gaps in HSD and other aspects that weren't covered in the survey. So this um, illustrates the um, ranking, weighted average ranking from one not being important on the way, Y axis to five being extremely important um, for these HS, various HSD capabilities and tools. So the priority ranking um, shows that, you know, the, that the users really want a, a suite of case studies that they can um, use across multiple configurations and applications, followed by uh, wanting the capability for nesting and um, as well as cloud resolving models. And then what scored lowest was a large eddy simulation capability. So we had a couple open ended questions, um, gaps in HSD and other aspects that were um, in the, um, the survey. And so the emerging themes were the importance that HSD needs to span across all model components. Um, and not just be like atmospheric centric. The capability to initialize a model with a large variety of data sets, um, improved model data, improved data management with easy access and reliable and consistent data, a need for a highly configurable and well documented testing workflow, a one stop shop to test relevant case studies using different capabilities, and then finally establishing methodologies and criteria across the uh, hierarchical, hierarchical levels of uh, testing. So with that, we put together some recommendations. Um, and so these recommendations relate to the um, hierarchical axes that we had um, uh, talked about previously. So sample size, hierarchy of scales, simulation realism and mechanism and interaction denial. The numbers on here um, represent the level of effort needed to um, to develop or um, continue supporting these. Oh, and then the second number is the level of necessity. Um, so for sample sizes, um, we recommend setting up a suite of case studies that represent model challenges or shortcomings that would be hosted on a community website. That's a one-stop shop that would span multiple configurations and applications and include cases with longer timeframes. So the DTC already has developed something like this, so it, it should be fairly easy for um, Epic to integrate this into the, the, the and, and support this themselves. Um, for hierarchy of scales, we recommend um, the capability of providing traditional nesting or variable resolution, and also cloud resolving models. For simulation realism, this is probably one of the, the harder things um, for Epic to stand up. Um, so really developing a highly configurable and well-documented framework for running idealized simulations. Mechanism and interaction denial. So just continued enhancement of existing capabilities such as the single column model and inclusion of new configurations and capabilities as well. And then lastly, um, other aspects that we recommend. So providing a common testing infrastructure, including software testing on top of scientific advancement for all model components and applications. And we're aware that um, Epic is currently developing a, a C-test based 
uh, infrastructure for doing unit testing and end-to-end -end system testing and so on. Um, we recommend expanding the initial conditions or boundary condition data sets supported by the modeling system. Um, so starting out easy, making sure that we're supporting things like ERA-5 or ECMWF. Um, um, improved data management and accessibility to allow for consistent and reliable data for scientific testing and model comparison. And then develop, developing a hierarchical workflow that adequately supports HSD, allowing multiple configurations. For example, CS, CSM can um, be used uh, for various dy dynamical cores and also configured for aquaplanet and so on. So this is just a summary. So HSD is an efficient pathway for model development. It connects our understanding from simple to complex models and it enables R2O by providing these testing frameworks for innovations and updates. Um, we did do a community-wide survey to provide valuable feedback regarding the current state and future needs in HSD um, in, in pertaining to UFS, but again, this can be used for other earth system models. So really it's a, it's a call for collaboration to kind of um, um, develop these um, recommendations um, for HSD across the Earth system modeling community. And then so we are um, providing recommendations for EPIC based off the current expertise and survey responses that we um, got. So if you have any questions, I don't know if I have time for that, but uh, okay. okay. Thank you, uh, questions? Can you uh, walk over here or <laughs> over there? Like that here is not working, everybody. Oh, I'm just glad. Well, line up here. <laughs> uh, so, my question relates to the uh, slide you had about the uh, survey response, and it was a bar chart showing uh, various. Um, levels of support for different activities right. that go on. And I was thinking that um, it, it might be even more informative to show the, the range of responses because um, in discussions I've had with um, in other groups, uh, some people value one activity very lowly while other people value the same activity very highly. And so an average of those two, two things doesn't really paint the picture of how, right. how important that is for the whole group. Right. So it's, it's a question of like inclusivity or, or are we making things convenient for the management to pick an activity? So if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, and, and that's, that's a very good point. And we have just started really looking into these survey results. So yeah, that, that's a, we, we can certainly um, look into that um, for the uh, future analysis of the results. Yeah, and provide that information. And, and we are gonna have this in the white paper. So, um, and, and I don't know how broadly distributed that white paper will be, but um, hopefully hopefully it can be shared among, you know, the whole earth, earth system community, so. Kind of similar, but, you know, that's a lot. I mean, everything you describe here is not, it's not trivial. And I'm wondering what what is um, you know UFS's priority in terms of development? Which of these things do they think do you think is the kind of top three priorities, for example? Because I mean the, the aim is for development, I guess, from UFS perspective, which is different from kind of research understanding of processes. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, I really think that the the one of the priorities for the, the UFS is really to establish a, these unified physics suites that can be um, used uh, across a, a broad range of you know, um, applications and um, um, scales, um, uh, um, both spatial and temporal. Um, so yeah, uh, but as in terms of, um, some of these components, or not components, but um, uh, capabilities and tools, I'm, I'm not actually sure what they would be most interested in. All right, thank you, Tracy. We're gonna move on to the next presentation by Ufuk. And he's gonna talk to us about hierarchy again, hierarchical testing of ESMF NOAPC components. 
Thank you. Yeah. You have to say your last name yourself. Turuncholu. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I am planning to talk a little bit more about the hierarchical testing. I think it's an integral part of the hierarchical system development because the testing also aims to bring a robust system for you. So I think both of them is tightly integrated. Um, I use this one. Okay, thank you. So, uh, uh, I think this is the old version of my presentation. So I can, can, I mean, can you open? I can uh, it's already in the. I didn't download anything past 12 o'clock, but we can definitely check it out. When did you upload it? Yeah, you can You can open this one. This one. Okay. The, this okay. one right here, nine? Yeah, this one, nine. Okay. Let's make sure it's up to date first, though, because yeah. this is all we got. Yeah. No. OK, it doesn't matter. So I, I had a couple of things, but yeah, this is not the last version. But um, yeah, uh, so uh, I am presenting this work. And, but this work is basically a result of the lots of discussion with the SMF team internally. Plus, it's supported by the GTTI project, uh, supported by uh, JTTI project, and we are we are currently continue to this work as a part of the coastal app project. So I am mostly working with the uh, with the with the UFS model. So as I told you before, the hierarchical system development and testing is very in, uh, integral. And so I will give some example from UFS in terms of its complexity, but you can easily port that one to a CSM because we are. At this point, the UFS and CSM sharing lots of different, lots of components at this point. Uh, so I, I can see both work. I am working at NCAR, mostly working with the UFS model. So I can see both work and, and there are lots of similarities over there and also some limitations. Um, and then as a result of those uh, 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 limitations, we start an initial attempt to create a very basic testing system to test the component itself outside of the application because sometimes testing the component is hard because you need to resolve all those dependencies, you need to know the model itself. So the, the zero level approach needs to be in the component level. So before going to the application, it could be CSM, it could be UFS. So this is very similar uh, diagram from the previous talk. So as you can see, developing a multi-component system model is a challenging task because you have lots of components. It requires lots of dependencies. You need to do tests extensively because, for example, in some component, development in, in a particular component could affect easily the other components, right? So the, the testing is important. The hierarchical system development basically give you a capability to to, to develop, for example, specific part of the model, maybe you can you can you can you can improve, for example, cumulus convection or something like that. Maybe you can improve the the feedback uh, uh, mechanism in some particular region, the two-way interaction. So uh, this two one is tightly integrated. For example, you can have single column model, you can have a, a coherent. They are very simple, but at the end of the day, you need to test your software. Because, for example, even if you are running a queer planet in a single in a single model, it could the, the in the software development in terms of the software development perspective, something can go wrong, and then you can get some wrong answer because maybe you will interact with CCPP or something like that, right? Um, uh, the example is the UFS. This is the this is not the up to date version of the UFS model because. Lots of different application, regional applications, seasonal application, coastal app is another another one. So there are lots of uh, different components over there. So for example, let's assume that okay, we are sharing CMAPs, CDEPs with the CSM, MOM6 uh, CIs, 
is also shared by the CSM. So there are lots of shared components over there. And as you can see, it's very complex and lots of components. So it's hard to test the system with this way because it brings lots of complexity to the system. And then it's hard for the regular user or regular developer that needs to implement, for example, recently the, the, the land group brings another data set, for example, soil color color to, to land component. So that is seems like a single component, but it also affects the other component because you have an interaction here, you are coupling with the land, right? So the first, you need to be sure that the standalone component, the single component works as you expected. Uh, if you look at the US, UFS testing system, there are two different parts over there. The first one is automated testing system. It's integrated with the continue, con, uh, 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 continuous development and integration system. So it's testing on cloud. And also there is a auto RT, we can call it regression system. system. Uh, in every PR, this auto RT is triggered to run the tier one systems, for example, Orion, MSU Orion, uh, NCAR, Cheyenne, and other platforms. And then every PR is tested, all the, all the regression tests in every platform is tested in every PR. So this is a huge task because you are, you are using too much resource over that. And then you can also trigger the same same test manually uh, before creating a PR, right? So you have to be sure that your development will not break anything in terms of other applications in the in the system. And also there are another requirement. Okay, even if you run the all regression test, or oh, everything is passed, you can still run the operational requirement test. So those are uh, the tra trading test, API test, the composition test. You have to pass all of all of that. I I met a couple of PR in the UFS side, and then it's it's too hard. So it takes a couple of weeks until you your development merge with the UFS model. But that's fine because you push you to create a robust system, right? So it's a challenging work. It's a challenging task, but you, you need to do it. Otherwise, it's impossible to uh, ensure. So this UFS regression testing system includes standalone model tests, a coupled configurations with the CDEPs, uh, and fully coupled configuration. The, the last time I checked that there was 234 different tests in the regression testing system. And think and multiply that one with the tier one system, maybe six different platforms. So lots of testing for every PR. Um, what's the limitation in here? So as I see, if you want to test something, if you, if you develop something in a standalone component, and if you want to test that one, you need to check out the entire system and then you need to test it that way. So there is no any easy way to plug your standalone component, put outside and test over there. So um, that brings additional complexity in terms of the user and develop, uh, developers because it requires lots of work and then requires additional expertise in every component and also the UFS system itself. Um, and existing test, testing system, okay, we are testing lots of different configuration, but it's not perfect. I know a sing, single uh, incident that, okay, the, the model passed all the regression tests, but they were expecting a baseline change. And they accept that, okay, we will have a baseline change and then they, they merge the PR. Everything was fine. The baseline is replaced. But at the end of the day, uh, they found that the ocean doesn't send any SSD to atmospheric model. So they missed that very obvious problem because they were expecting baseline change. So the testing system doesn't cover everything. So you can miss these kinds of big issues even with this complex testing system. Uh, and as you can see, there is no any easy way, convention or standard in terms of testing. CSM has its own testing system. UFS has its own testing system. They are sharing the components, but they are not sharing the tests. 
So what happens if you could able to expose your test? For example, there is a particular test in MOM6. You can expose that test to UFS and then UFS can easily get that test and then use it, right? So that, that will be perfect. So uh, the solution for, for perfect uh, world, you can change the different configuration from very simple to complex. Uh, it's, it, it could be published along with the source code. That will be great because then your testing suite will, will live with the source code itself. And then you will be sh sure that those tests will run with that particular version of the model. And the top level application could inherit those individual tests and maybe blend them together to create more tests, right? If you have a standalone configuration for two different components, maybe top level system could blend them to together and create a couple configuration for you on the fly. Of course, you can you can customize it and change some parameters over there, but this can, can this kinds of capability will help you to uh, create more tests easily. Um, yeah, sharing the test is the is the main idea over there. And maybe you can you can specify some simple tests that can be easily run on a CDCI system, for example, GitHub Actions or something like that. But this requires definition of rules, standards to represent those individual tests, because without those standards, it's hard to write a common tool that will work for different applications. Uh, Okay, in, in this case, the red bull, bull, bullet is trying, we are trying to achieve uh, some level of um, testing system to solve those red kinds of things. We are not trying to solve everything because we are, at this point, we are trying to create some kinds of a prototype system that can be maybe in the future that can be a part of this more complex system. So this is an, an example coming from the NOAA MP. No IMP is, is a standalone land component. Uh, we are trying to bring that, that uh, component to UFS. So in this case, the top one, uh, okay, let's start with the bottom one, this one. So this is the this is the, the uh, this is the this is the new repository to test the standalone components and their no ESMF no apps interface. ESMF no apps interface is basically responsible to couple the components with the others. So in this case, this, this is a composite action that gives you a capability to plug any standalone model component and create a test for it. For example, in this case, we are trying to create a data atmosphere force, a no IMP force with the data atmosphere provided by the CDEPs. And this directory is basically defines the test. It, it, it stores information related with the configuration files. It stores information related with the input files. And at the end of the day, this specific YAML file calls the composite action defined in here and sends all those information to the composite action and composite action build the dependencies, create nameless files, get the input files for you and run that specific, very simple application in GitHub uh, runner. So this is very simple application in C96 resolution. It do means, okay. Oh, <clears throat> okay, this dependencies is basically handled by the SPAC. So we are creating this SPAC YAML file on the fly based on the user provided input. For example, your model could have different dependencies. It could need ESMF, it could need FMS, it could need another library, it doesn't matter. If Spark is able to install that specific package, we can handle it. And without this generic driver layer provided by the ESMF no we, we are calling it as an ESMX, it's impossible to create executable outside of the application, right? Because CSM has its own driver, UFS has its own driver. You need to get that that driver into the picture. Otherwise you can create executable for standalone, uh, standalone component. But since the, the last public release, the ESMF provides a good generic driver for you. So this simplified the process. 
you can handle the different input source. For example, you can get the data from SVN, you can get the data from GitHub, or you can get the data from Amazon S3 buckets. So all those are defined in, in a YAML file. The nameless files uh, are also handled through these YAML files. We are using Parambian. Alper is probably here. So thanks to Alper to write that specific tool because it simplifies everything and then we can create different kinds of nameless files for, for the run. Uh, yeah, as a summary, this uh, new composite action will give you a capability to test your component in the, in the lowest level. And then you can, of course, you can go, go further and then you can test your configuration or model in the application itself. But this is automa automated system that will work in every PR. And then you will be sure that your component coupling interface will work. And then you can, you can also test with different version of ESMS, okay? Different compilers. And you can test multiple configuration. For example, you can force fit the era five or you can force fit different data sets in the same configuration. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, it, it, it tries to provide sets of uh, standards and conventions. Maybe in the future, we can, we can push this one to make it more generic and then shareable between different applications. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> Okay. Sure. Sorry, we will we'll not have time for questions for this one. So catch you folk uh, in the dinner at the right back. So we're going to move on to the next presentation that will be remote by uh, Kevin Blackman. And he will talk to us about repeatable infrastructure as code and CI CD pipeline working to speed up innovations. And that's his work in the Earth Prediction Innovation Center, EPIC. Um, so here comes help. Hey, how are you doing, Leisure? Yeah, just give us a second to switch the presentation. Is this next person remote? Kevin. Kevin is remote. Is he remote? remote. He's remote. Okay. I can just share my screen as well, if that's easier. It's up to you. Oh, yes, please, Kevin. That would be fantastic on our end. Perfect. All yeah. right, great. Go ahead, Kevin. OK. Hey, how's everybody doing? My name is Kevin Blackman. I'm on Epic. Uh, so thanks for the other presentations. It was, it was great to kind of see what um, you know others that we partner with are, are up to. Um, so with that, I'll just kind of take it away here. So we're going to kind of talk real quickly, give some thanks to our partners, talk about community infrastructure, um, talk about the pipeline. And um, interestingly enough, I, I ended it just with, you know, needs for, for more testing. And it was great to see the, the last couple of presentations, uh, you know, dive into that. So a couple, couple comments there. Um, first, uh, thanks to our partners, uh, lots of partners within uh, NOAA, as well as working with the three uh, cloud service providers. Um, to, uh, to to kind of do some of the work here. Um, so with that, just a quick overview. Um, so Epic kind of works with uh, quite a few different areas. We work with, uh, you know, the academia, government, um, industry, um, trying to predominantly work with the UFS as uh, the last couple of presenters have talked about as well. And um, really kind of just build out the infrastructure is really what we're gonna talk to you about today. So if we look at, you know, the main, um, a suite of operational um, implementations that we're, we're working on. Predominantly right now, we've been working on short range weather, as well as starting to work with HAFs in the coastal team. And that brings us to this. So when we think of Epic, a lot of what we're going to talk about today is, is a lot of the, the cloud base. So how do we you know, come up with uh, infrastructure as code or a really easy way to, to replicate that? Um, and, and we'll kind of talk about that, as well as uh, some of our software engineering um, efforts around um, pipelines. So right now we have a pipeline to support um, short range weather application, as well as um, the weather model. And we kind of can test on all you know tier one platforms, as well as uh, all three cloud service providers and, and test uh, you know, that, is, that is working. And we'll kind of 
kind of show you some examples of some other tool suites that we brought in for static code analysis, as well as as other kind of uh, software best practices that that we that we can look at within the team. And, and the last piece to this is everything we have, we really try and be really transparent about. So I'll show you like a quick example. So if you if you want, um, all of this is public. You know, we have dashboards that look at um, a lot of our GitHub, who's contributing, you know, where are they from, what issues are we tracking, um, all the Jenkins artifacts, so all the uh, peer reviews that, that come through. Um, we put all the, the uh, peer reviews that are public as well as what the output looks like. So, you know, if some users don't have a cap where they, you know, can't get into our CIC suite, um, we do try and uh, have a way to be transparent with that. Um, so those are kind of some of the biggest principles is, is everything we do in various applications. We try and have a, have a community presence for it. Okay. So the first one we'll talk about is, is a lot of our cloud service providers. So we, we support all three uh, cloud service providers and we have um, quite a few different accounts. We have um, really about 10 right now. Um, and we work with all three cloud service providers as well as parallel works to kind of uh, make sure that the, um, that, that they're working as performant as, as possible. They're, they're constantly changing the infrastructure. They're constantly changing uh, what uh, resources are out there. So we wanna make sure that um, we're kind of up to speed in that. And it's really kind of, a, if you don't have parallel works or if you don't work in the industry, it's, it's kind of a, uh, a challenge to, to set this up on your own. So what we've done, the first kind of part of this presentation is um, HashiCorp has a, a thing called Packer. And what Packer does is, you know, really at the 10,000 foot view, it's a way to say, I want to run on AWS and I want to run SRW application. And I just want to set it up really quickly. Um, and you have about 12 lines of code and you can um, have um, all the head and compute nodes all set up, um, key cluster. I mean, really all the high level things that you need in the cloud to, to run SRW in, in about 12 commands. And we've done that for um, other applications going forward as well, um, as Landier and others come online. Um, at the end of the day, if you go to that repository um, and we're constantly looking at it, um, you can support any of the three cloud service providers and you can build that out. And there's also a website link on there. So if you wanna go and check it out, we do have like a tutorial walkthrough. So it's, it's pretty easy. So I'll show you a quick example here. So if we go to our, our GitHub, um, really at the end of the day, um, in a second here. So they basically there's some very AWS specific things and there's some very uh, Azure and GCP specific things. So we kind of just annotate those and then, um, and, and that's what makes it pretty easy in the end. And then at the, there's a application suite on here as well. So you can kind of, right now we just have SRW, we're gonna um, add in land EA and others pretty soon, but it's a pretty easy way to build out um, everything and stage it. So it puts stack stack on there. Um, it'll build it. It'll, you know, build the compiler you're looking for. It'll add SRW. Um, it'll stage the data that's needed. And really when you get to the end, you're ready to run uh, SRW. And again, this is all automated. So with about 12 clicks of a button, you are in AWS and you are running um, applications uh, pretty easily. So when we start looking at you know academia and industry, this is kind of what they're looking for. They're like, oh, we want to start using you know UFS, but but you know there's some some setup work. And, and um, if we go if we circle back to Packer, the one thing it does is kind of really takes all that out of it. Um, there's no kind of like hand holding to the process anymore. It's it's pretty repeatable. Um, it's pretty maintainable. And we work with all three cloud service providers to make sure the images that we're um, sending out there are, are the most performant as possible. Okay, um, so next, um, we, we were kind of uh, building out pipelines for applications as well as the, the weather models. And I'm not gonna really dig into this too much, but but really what we do is we have tools that kind of associate with, with all of them. And we don't have failure gates, right? A gate is simply, you know, pass fail. Um, so we do look at, you know, static code analysis. An example is we use Sonar Cube. So if you want, you can look at, which one do I have up? Uh, I have the weather model up. So you can actually go in and, um, you know, look at what bugs it's currently flagging, you know, hotspots, other uh, security parameters. Um, there's other measures in here. You can kind of go and look at, you know, overall maintainability. 
and see, you know, which areas should I focus on that are that are, you know, kind of the um, the least friendly to maintain. So as new developers come in, um, it's easier for them to start working on applications. So it, it does give you uh, a lot of flexibility for a, a static code analysis tool, and it'll also give you the difference between um, new checked in um, compared to the overall. So some other examples are we uh, do a lot of the dependency checks. We do some um, what they call linting and nagging, making sure everything is fairly secure. Um, and then we do uh, static code analysis, and then we run you know, the regression tests uh, at the end. Um, some additional things we're building in. So we do have you know average build time, average time per gate is already there, um, as well as a uh, uh, code coverage. We're going to start working in um, all of our hackathons this year are geared towards C test or how do we build in more unit testing into all the applications? Because really the ability to fail quickly or pat or succeed quickly is gonna come at, you know, as a couple of presenters have talked about as well um, with a more robust uh, testing suite. And then, um, you know, skill, uh, skill scorecard at the end to kind of uh, look at your overall results. So right now today, this is kind of uh, uh, two pipelines that we have. So we have a master pipeline, which basically kind of tests it on all of your uh, tier one systems. And then we have what we call a no integration pipeline. Uh, right now, our, our no integration pipeline is just the ability to um, test everything in its piece parts. Is it going to compile? Is, you know, do we get uh, clean static code analysis? Um, is it is it functionally sound so that you can then run it too? So uh, one thing we're really doing a lot of is, is spending a lot of resources. So we're constantly looking at ways um, to do to do less. Uh, we also have a, a version of this that we're trialing in GitHub Actions. So we're going to have kind of the same idea, have a quick um, uh, quick fail case of, you know, can you test something really quickly for developers to um, get a quick sanity check without spending a lot of resources and, and allocation. And that's something that we're really going to put a lot of effort into, you know, as well as other teams, um, since it is obviously a, a big thing. And, and we do try and test on the cloud whenever possible. Uh, because we obviously um, do have more allocation there. So that's that's pretty much it. It's the idea of, you know, we have a master pipeline where we can test everything, but then we also have um, other pipelines that support, you know, the, the ability to fail quickly. And, and we've, we're constantly working with the community to ask them, you know, what other areas they're looking for. And again, I can't stress this enough, but everything for all of our artifacts, you can come in, and you can really check out anything. So for successful scans, you can come in and check out any of the artifacts associated with those PRs. Um, we just added in uh, SRW and we'll add in the weather model um, in the other um, applications that we support pretty soon. Okay, so I talked about the dashboards. I figured it'd be more fun to pull them up. Um, and then the last piece is uh, tutorials and training. So. We do have a lot of uh, tutorials and training on running various applications in the cloud, and, and we really want to start working more with the development teams. So we're, we're always looking for, for new areas um, to, to improve. And I, I think one of the biggest ones we're focusing on this year that we heard feedback on is more C test or how do we add more unit tests. We've already had one code sprint on it, which we had almost 50 people show up. That was our largest one to date. Um, and, and we added quite a few um, unit tests to, to various repositories. So, we're going to continue to do that for this year and see if we can add in um, some more unit tests. So, you know, if you want to come check out our website and um, we'd love to hear about differing activities um, that, that you will find useful as well. Um, we also have that summer workshop coming up, which will be um, out um, where you guys are at now. And we'll um, also be uh, doing a, a bunch of the applications. We have AWS coming out as well as Azure. And they will also be putting on um, various uh, various workshops throughout the week with a free allocation, which is which is nice. So uh, they're going to support us uh, pretty heavily there. And then the last, I'm just going to close on just this uh, quick test framework. I, I thought this was great that there was a lot of testing. Um, we've really been trying to you know work with the community in the same aspect and and really push C test. And this is kind of what our next uh, code sprint is on. So we're always looking at ways like how do we build an infrastructure that allows us to, to fail or succeed quickly, um, it, as that's really going to allow uh, peer reviews to push a lot quicker um, and, and work with the community in that aspect. So with that, um, that's all I had. And thank you very much for your time. Any questions?
if I have time left, I think I'm right there. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, questions? Okay, let's see if there's any online. online. Okay, well, thank you so much, Kevin. So we're gonna move on to our last presentation that will be by Jesse Nussbaumer. And he will talk to us about the CCPP implementation and Karen Seymour. Yes, it is yours, correct? Yep, that's it. Perfect. Let me just share my screen real quick. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, so thanks everyone for staying till the end and you know, give a shout out to what I see with the last two like remote people online uh, for staying on the way. Uh, I'm here to talk about, well, first of all, my name is Jesse. I'm a software engineer in CGD in the AMP section. And I'm here to talk about implementing CCPP in Camp SEMA. And don't worry, I'll explain all those acronyms. Try to give it a more literary flair. So uh, we'll just, I also thought of this talk as a tale of two times two repos. This work, yes. Okay, so uh, SEMA, the System for Integrated Modeling in the Atmosphere. Uh, every time I've tried to describe SEMA, afterwards someone tells me I'm wrong. And so I instead will just say that a hypothesis for SEMA is uh, a, a fundamental infrastructure framework uh, that basically would allow one to try to run all, to try to cover all the domains that are currently split up among a bunch of different independent models among uh, uh, NCAR, right? So in theory, a, a system that could run, obviously, what CAM can do now, as well as things like MPAS, WARF, all the way eventually down to LES. Um, one of the keys of SEMA is that actually a lot of what it was originally requested for the first version already exists in CAM. Um, that includes uh, multiple dicores, uh, chemistry, obviously CAM physics, uh, data simulation, and um, ionosphere, thermosphere. So given that, it, is, it was very recently decided that CAM would form the basis of uh, SEMA itself. Uh, however, CAM's also been around a long time, it had a lot of technical debt. And so we decided to kind of, at the same time, try to rewrite CAM to pay off all of that technical debt. Um, that's resulted now in a new repo, the first repo of my story, uh, which you can't read, but it's CAM SEMA um, and it's public, it's on ESComp. Uh, so yeah, you know, uh, star it, watch it, fork it, just don't run it because it doesn't run. So, uh, but it is there and it will form eventually the basis for what we hope to be SEMA. And also too, if you've heard in the past, people refer to, by people, I mean me, refer to Camden or new Cam, that is Cam SEMA. So the, there is only now one repo in Cam SEMA. Okay, well back to Cam. Uh, you know, CAM has most of the features we want for SEMA, but it is missing things. In particular, it's missing non-CAM physics, right? Missing the war physics that we use in MPAS, it's missing uh, UFS physics, et cetera. So how would we, how can we bring those new physics into SEMA, CAM SEMA? <clears throat> um, so this is what's currently done in CAM. And so you can imagine on the right, can I do this? Nope. Uh, imagine on the right uh, is the core, physics scheme code. So that's what the physics developer has written. And it's probably just its, its own module or subroutine. Uh, and this is actually a real example. This is for the ZM deep convection. On the far left is something called phys package F90, which is uh, basically a giant Fortran file that tolls a bunch of other Fortran subroutines. And, uh, but the key about it is it controls the order of physics. So if you want deep to run before shallow or shallow run before deep, you'd have to set that in phys package. In between there are then uh, usually one to two other Fortran files, um, which essentially take uh, CAM specific data structures, uh, the state uh, DDT, 10 DDT, something that people know or not know of, the physics buffer, uh, and then uh, translate that into the standard variables that the original physics developer uh, was looking for. 
Um, the problem is right now that these basically all have to be written by hand. And so if you were to imagine to bring in the entire war suite or the entire UFS suite, all of us in this room combined, you know, would probably take a decade to do so. So, um, so it's basically not feasible. So how can we get around having to just write by hand all of these interfaces? Uh, well, what we can do is we can use the Common Community Physics Package or the CCPP, um, which is a CCPP is a joint effort between, I believe, NCAR, NOAA, and the Navy. Lisa can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, okay, cool, got it. Uh, so, um, but basically the goal is you can imagine down at the bottom, those are um, the core physics, you know, that's what the physics developer has built uh, as a physics scheme or parameterization. And then at the very top, that yellow box, is the host model, so this would be CAM SEMA. Um, and what the CCPP does is by providing metadata from both the host model and the physics scheme, we have the CCPP framework that'll generate the interface for you. So it will create the source code needed to connect the physics, all the physics schemes to the host model. And so that means in theory, the only thing we would need to do is create this extra metadata for already CCPP compliant physics and it should connect automatically. And I'll describe what metadata is exactly needed and what that looks like. Um, however, the CCPP framework is obviously its own code base and that's my second repo of this story is the NCAR CCPP framework, um, which is already, again, it's also public. You're free to go check it out. It does run, unlike CAMSEMA. Um, there is one caveat, uh, although Noah, it's already even using the uh, UFS. Uh, technically, actually, us and Noah don't use the exact same version of the framework. We use they, Noah currently uses something called Prebuild. We use something called CapGen. This has been known for a while, and so we kind of already have a list of all the things we need to do to unify. So a lot of times you might hear of CapGen unification or framework unification. That's what it is. There's a caveat though. So this is just a screenshot of part of a spreadsheet. And on the very far right, you see the names Steve and Dom. Uh, <laughs> so Dom is actually still around and helping us. Um, however, he's mostly working with Jedi, so different groups and he's kind of left. Steve is no longer with us. And so in the sense that he's no longer at NCAR, he's, he is still alive. He's, at, he, he's in Norway, but he's also preoccupied. Um, so, so we were kind of stuck for a while. We weren't sure how we could make up for that lost effort. Um, luckily, we have two um, people who have kind of stepped into uh, stepped into their shoes. On the Noah side, we have Dustin Swales, who apparently had decided to use his favorite cell culture as a GitHub profile. And then we have Courtney Peverly on the NCAR side. Uh, they're doing her best impression of Russell Brand. Uh, that's not a joke. That's literally uh, a picture of her doing Russell Brand. But regardless of their GitHub profile pictures, they actually are really good software engineers and developers. And so we're confident that they will be able to to unify the framework, which eventually will allow us, you know, NCAR to share our physics with NOAA, and NOAA to share their physics with us. Um, okay, so back to the original issue of how do we get, how can the CDBP help us connect a physics scheme to the host model? And so, of course, one of the first things is how do we decide the order of the physics and what physics are actually going to include in a particular run? Uh, for the uh, CDBP, we have something called a sweet definition file. Uh, which is just an XML file. And this is a, this is a real example. This is for Held Suarez, which is a simplified version of the physics. Uh, and essentially what you do is you just list schemes that correspond to specific physics parameterization. So you can imagine for a more complete physics package, you know, one scheme would be the deep convection, one scheme would be the boundary layer, one scheme would be radiation, et cetera. Um, the real advantage over that is then if I wanted to rearrange it, I just have to modify the XML file and literally just rearrange it. And the CCBP will automatically manage all of the Fortran and, and um, interconnects between data structures and whatnot to, to get that to work. Um, and that's a big deal because we ran recently for CAM7, we tried to rearrange our physics and it took a significant amount of time. Um, other things too, this is always brought up, I should point out, even though it's not shown here, that you can also allow for subcycling in these sweet definition files. So you can have a sub loop inside if you wanted to certain physics schemes run more, uh, more or less often. Um, you could also do time and process splitting. <clears throat> okay. So then what you needed to actually generate the interface itself, that part really the kind of the hard part. Um, so you need two, you need basically two files. One is on the right, the actual, of course, source file for that physics scheme or physics parameterization. 
Um, a lot of times, at least for the campus, you can't just take it straight as is. Um, the reason is because the CCPP needs essentially the code to be split up into initialization steps, kind of run steps, which are done all you know every time step, and then finalization steps. But in some ways, that's kind of good for us to do anyways, because um, it uh, helps. It basically just helps keep our code cleaner, and then also you know avoids things like uh, constantly reallocating something during a, a time step. Uh, <clears throat> um, so on the left is then the metadata file, and this is the this is the information, the file, I guess I say, that contains all the metadata the CCBP needs to know how to take Fortran variables or, or source code variables that have to be Fortran and uh, um, connect it to the host model. And so you can see on the left in the square brackets is the actual variable name in the source code. And then below that is metadata. Um, and most of that metadata is already is stuff you probably recognize, right? Like intent, so is an intent in out. What's the type of the data? Is it you know real or is it an integer? If it has a kind, what kind does it have? What are its dimensions? Um, and then we also have, of course, unit, other two, two more required metadata information units, which are hopefully self-explanatory. And then um, the standard name, which the standard name is key because what that CCPB uses it as is so, um, for example, I'm gonna pick out DUDT, which we have the standard name tendency of XWIN. There could be somewhere else a different physics scheme that calls it D zonal DT or whatever. But if it has the same standard name, tendency of XWIM, then the CCPP knows these are actually the same physical quantity. This is the same variable. And so if I need to pass them to each other, I can, I'm, I'm allowed to do so. Um, so these files are all stored in our third repo in the story, uh, which is the NCAR atmospheric physics repo. Again, it is public. Uh, it's, not really anything to run, but you could look at it if you want. Um, and as you can see at the bottom, you know, there's XML files, those are sweet definition files. And then in the folders, we have the actual physics Fortran code and metadata files. Um, and right now we only have kind of simple schemes and basic utilities, but over time this should grow substantially. And there's also discussion if this will eventually get merged. Right now we're using this because it allows us to do rapid development. There might in the future, it might be joined in with uh, NOAA CCPP physics repo, but that's still to be discussed. <clears throat> okay, so back to standard names. That's just uh, text saying what I've already said. Um, but it's a fun exercise to actually try to create a standard name for a variable. And so I'm going to give you an example. So in in CAM right now, there's a variable that's just called Q, uh, which in if you were to open an atmospheric science textbook, you would like to actually see Q and equations, but that's not super uh, informative. So one person said, well, okay, we can do out specific humidity. That's, that's a, those are words. And, you know, it's, <laughs> and we generally all kind of agree on what specific humidity is, except for apparently we don't agree on what specific humidity is. This is a real example, by the way. I'm not, uh, uh, there was discussions of, you know, it was unclear what the denominator was because uh, it's usually the mass of water over mass of something. So it's decided, okay, well, we'll just write it out. Water vapor mixing ratio and that mixing ratio seemed to be math. So water vapor mass mixing ratio with respect to moist air. And then, and then we found out other host models, i.e. us, uh, said, no, 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 we don't just have moist air. We also include condensates and other things. So we should say the word. So we decided instead to call it water vapor mixing ratio with respect to total mass. And then someone pointed out, well, you're not actually total mass because you're not including, you know, trace gases in your calculation, which technically contribute to the math. <laughs> Got you. So, uh, <laughs> so in the end, we landed on this water vapor mixing ratio with respect to moist air and condensed water. So um, I should point out that in the source code, you can still just use Q, but, uh, <laughs> but in the metadata file, you need to include that standard name to make sure that you match up with whatever other physics package needs it. Don't, don't try to read that. That's just evidence that we are oops, going through um, all of the variables in CAM uh, to find standard names for all of these quantities. And it is a painful task, but links to people like Peter and Julio and Adam and Cheryl and Courtney and John. Um, we were making progress and it's actually really been a productive activity because we found not only software bugs, basically we found variables that are really the same physical quantity, um, but have been re repeated um, or not used at all. 
And we've also found science issues, basically, where we found physics schemes that were using variables that weren't actually what they thought they were. Um, and so basically, you know, giving incorrect results. <clears throat> and that leads us to our final uh, repo of the story, which is the standard names repo, which is where we, at least NCAR and NOAA, try to agree on the standard names we like and rules for standard names. Uh, so yeah, I think that's, I don't know what time I'm at, but I think that's close to the end. You've now seen this, I think three times, four times, depending where you've gone. Um, this is a diagram. It was, I struggled to lift everyone who is connected to SEMA because it's a very big uh, activity and lots and lots of people are involved. Uh, this, my idea was in the center are people who have directly committed code to that CAM SEMA repo. On the green are people who haven't committed code but have been instrumental in um, uh, decisions made for Camp SEMA. And then blue are people who have contributed, if not to Camp SEMA, directly to other things like, the, of course, the framework or the physics or standard names, et cetera. Um, and there's probably many people I'm missing. This is like, I just came up with this last night and I was just trying to core dump. Uh, and I should point out that I suspect over time, everyone's going to wind up in the gray circle. So probably everyone in this room is going to wind up in this gray circle. So you can't escape it. Um, oh, this is an older version. Well, I should point out, uh, also get in contact with me because there is coming up in a couple months, a CCPP visioning workshop where we're trying to figure out um, basically what the future of the CCPP is. So if you're interested in, and it's free and it's online, it's virtual, but if you're interested in, in giving your opinion or thoughts on what would you like the CCPP to do, please contact myself or Leisha and we will send you the info. Uh, okay, so that's it. Thank you for listening. Enjoyed it. <laughs> I don't really do anything. I just, yeah. I'm not... Yeah, do you wanna uh, walk up here? Uh, Yeah, the question was, uh, is this package dot F90 uh, generated or in the repo? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, and yeah, in CAM, it's in definitely in the repo. In CAM SEMA, it's generated. Okay, uh, my question is, given that we're starting, it, this gives an opportunity to pay close attention to glue code between dynamics and physics. Is there an opportunity right now to pass more time-stepping information between uh, physics packages and uh, dynamics so that it can be more systematically treated within the die core? Like as an opt-in kind of thing. Uh I mean, yeah, I guess from a software engineering standpoint, the answer is yes. Uh, I think the question would just be what kind of information you would want between the two. But I can say, this may not be against your question, but I know, for example, already in CCP PI schemes, you know, we'll have like, this is the air temperature at the previous time step, uh, but it's obviously you can access it at the current time step. Uh, and, and and other things you would need for say like leapfrogging. Mm -hmm. So uh, that helps. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep, yeah, one minor question. So I know that UFS model, the CCPP physics package, has lots of parameters tightly integrated with the model itself, for example, FE3. So how are you planning to handle those kinds of things? Because I think you have a plan to merge those physics package together, right? So if you want to use the UFS CCPP physics parameterization under CAM SEMA, you need to handle this, that kind of thing, right? Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, part of that, kind of part of that's both of our ends. Like I know Noah is working to try to make their physics more general and less tightly, tightly coupled to FE3. And, and also on top of that though, we're also, well, it's under debate, but the hope is to also bring in FE3 under CAM SEMA. So that also gives us uh, an access point. But um, uh, yeah, and then I guess the third thing I'll just say to that, um, uh, and that's part of the reason why we're also making sure, you know, we agree on standard names. We have the same framework, the CZPP framework. Uh, and sorry, and then the, the final point is it could just be there might be physics schemes that we've just either 
we just, we just might not be able to bring over it depending that they're like really tightly coupled to the UFS. Uh, that ideally that wouldn't happen, but I don't want to like guarantee we'll absolutely bring everything over without question. So, uh, but yeah, I don't know if that helps. I think we're at time. So thank you, Jesse. Uh, let's uh, thank our speaker. <laughs> And we have one more uh, wrap, up, uh, wrap up session, right? With the entire workshop. Uh, okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So, so, I think some of the. Uh, Thank you.